Good morning. Sorry for the, the delay. I'll call to order the Planning Commission meeting of October 20th, 2016. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Will the clerk please call the roll? Commissioner Dupas. Here. Commissioner Kelly. Here. Commissioner Onstott. Here. Commissioner Kessley. Here. Commissioner Rodriguez. Here. Thank you. Now is the time for public comments. This is time set aside for comments by citizens on matter not appearing on the agenda. And I understand we have two. So I would like to call Rick. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Rick. <laughs> Could you please? Makani. your attention the fact that we're ending ending a uh, Santa Ana condition in the mountains uh, which are mostly affected by the Santa Anas my biggest wind gust in the last 24 hours was 58 miles an hour in the fire of 2013 my recorded wind was 82 miles an hour I have a weather station at the top of my house that documents this uh, in 2007, we had three days of Santa Anna's, and uh, I went to bed at 10 o'clock at night, and the winds were blowing at 20 miles an hour. At 1 in the morning, they hit 90. At 7 in the morning, they hit 110. This is documented by the, National, uh, the Western Regional Climate Center station at the top of Laguna Peak which I suggest, I hope that you know where that is. <laughs> um, the winds exceeded over 100 miles an hour at that station seven times in the next three days. The lowest the wind got in those three days was 60 miles an hour. The problem is, and if you look at the map, I gave you, do you have copies of this? You can see the Santa, this is a graphic representation of the Santa Ana winds for Southern California um, just last week. And if you look at how those winds are distributed, there seems to be one point of confluence of all the winds in Southern California. <laughs> there is one spot where they really intensify. And if you look straight across from the Channel Islands, which I've highlighted, you will see that point. And that point is the Santa Monica Mountains, Ventura County. And um, the biggest problem we have is that we're surrounded by explosive chaparral that is very dry and so easily, uh, fire would spread in minutes. If you woke up at two o'clock in the morning to the smell of smoke, you better have had your fire preparation done and have had a safe place to go because you aren't going to have any time to respond. But I think that uh, in the future, you are going to be presented with um, plans from planning regarding this area. And I just think it's important that you keep in mind the problems that, and the dangers to the people who live out there. We're not allowing them to properly clear their property or make it prohibitively expensive for them to do so. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Questions? Thank you very much. Are there any questions of the speaker? Seeing none, thank you so much, sir. Jennifer Sage also would like to make a public comment. Good morning. Good morning, I'm Jennifer Sage. And um, just to make a comment, what he was saying, um, I was turning in on Victoria with my car behind another car, and 
it was so static in the air, uh, a Smucker's candy wrap plastered itself on the back of the bumper in the car in front of me, so I, I had to give that a laugh. I just thought that was funny. I was glad it wasn't on my car, but anyhow. <clears throat> okay, I'm here to discuss, uh, <clears throat> while we're, um, could you please upload the, uh, uh, the uh, PowerPoint, bring that up? <clears throat> and while we're waiting for this, um, just a quick synopsis. After the la over these last two to three years, our prized uh, California scen scenic views along our roadways and freeways are very rapidly and grossly diminishing <clears throat> due to Caltrans road safety guardrail systems and concrete center dividers soaring in heights. <clears throat> Excuse me, dry. <clears throat> dry weather. Maintenance and upgrades of existing guardrails are not matched like to like, so they should be going through the same permitting process as, as new guardrail projects. As long as Caltrans can continue to install their safety guardrail systems unchecked and without direction from this county and without established guidelines, thorough design review, creative planning, and special engineering, and a stringent permitting process in these highly sensitive areas of preservation to our coastal views, there will be little views left along our oceans to save, along our roadways to save. I'm here today for two reasons to ask. One, to put on hold for you board, to put on hold momentarily all Caltrans maintenance, upgrade, and new extension projects regarding guardrails and center dividers along our coastal zones that they may be brought in for review before more are replaced or added. And secondly and lastly, to establish a red line, if you will, and map out our ocean view sections of roadways so Caltrans can have clear information of where these sensitive areas are located that require from our government specific direction. This is a six-minute film. I hope you bear with me. Scenic Highway 101, Ventura County, 2016. This is documented almost a year ago. Do I press something to move it along? Or do I wave you? Or <laughs> is, is this what this is for, to go to the next one? Is this it? Just try clicking. Yeah, just try Maybe forward. There we go. Thank you. Past ocean views of Rincon Bay. This, Bay. this is past ocean views. This is before, as you look to the right, you can see um, before the path was installed two and a half years ago, it only had a rock revetment and 24 inch guardrail. Another view of what Rincon Bay used to look like. Presently, ocean views with bike guardrails from Rincon Bay to Seacliff. This is after the cyclist pedestrian path it has been installed. It's a 5.5 mile of ocean view front shorelines. And as you can see, it's covered up. It's a double two-sided guardrail path. The design is 54 to 59 inches in height obliterating our most prized and famous Rincon Point Ocean Bay view. A lost view in time of sand, surf, birds, whales, porpoises, and people playing. This is what we used to see from the roadways. Now take a note of the new implemented solid concrete center divider median also on your left, also to this pro added to this project. I'll come to this in just a minute. The measurements of the ocean side of the bike rail is 54 inches in height. The measurement of the motorist side of the bike path is 59 inches in height. To view the ocean view while driving at 65 miles per hour, motorists must turn their heads to look directly out at the passenger window. This requires a motorist to take their eyes off the road from looking ahead or using their peripheral vision. Also, this railing design gets pixelated at high speeds, is distracting, confusing, dizzying, and obstructive to the natural beauty of our ocean. 
In cases where bike path and pedestrian path runs along ocean view roadways, considerations for safety must be balanced with adherence to the scenic requirements of the Coastal Act, along with suggested policies outlined in the California Coastal Trail Policy. All options need to be explored, including lowering the bike path elevation or rerouting in the planning stages to ensure the views of all are not impeded by any well-intended safety measures. This is the present ocean views of the new solid concrete median, which I mentioned before. This is added, was added additionally to the, uh, the new solid concrete median motorist divider. This is part three of the double bike path railings. Over ocean views, 100, uh, 101 northbound is completely eliminated here. This is five and a half miles of solid concrete medians of soaring heights, reducing ocean views to infrequent glimpses of distant horizon, or no view at all. <clears throat> Old existing center dividers. <clears throat> the old existing motor center dividers were 24 to 28 inches high, and these are in jeopardy of being replaced by higher ones. The new center concrete medians are double in height and one from the one viewed here. We choose to take these coastal routes because of their intrinsic, intrinsic sit scenic value, so we need to remain vigilant and examine and question this incremental creep in safety barrier height. These lost views are permanent, and with the installation there is an implied right to make the next barriers just as high, if not even higher, as we are seeing now. Present ocean views with old existing shoreline guardrails. These are being endangered of being replaced right now. The speed limit has not been increased since these original ones were built on, the, on this freeway. These existing guardrails measure 20 four to 26 inches in height. Present ocean views existing without any shoreside guardrails. These are the present, without any. These guardrails are a 15 mile stretch of our ocean view shoreline that are endangered of having, of having new guardrails put in. And there, here you show there's none at all. This is what we have left to save. If not tagged, identified, mapped out, these two will be not left alone. And lastly, the new three-mile shoreline guardrail is being erected and installed right now. This is a three-mile long stretch from Emma Wood 101 northbound today. This newly erected guardrail is being placed right now as we are sitting here. Do we even need these guardrails in these locations? Where there was none before, and now these 36-inch guardrails are being installed this minute. Caltrans should be exposing and increasing our ocean views, not covering them up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions? I've Any been questions studying of the this for three years. <clears throat> I know a lot of things about guardrails as far as um, what we can do to lower them and the problems in the calculations that they're, um, they're not adhering to when they tell us they're going to build them at a certain height. There's many, many ways that we can get around 
uh, obliterating our views. And I've stud studied this very thoroughly, so please call on me. I have a wealth of information. I've studied this in depth. Thank you. Thank you. Next on the agenda, are there any other public comments? Seeing none, we'll move on. Next on the agenda is the approval of the July 28, 2016 minutes. Move adoption of the minutes. Second. Please vote. No, shit. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, now is item six on the agenda, PL12-0158, Local Coastal Program Update, Phase 2B. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Chair Dukas and the Planning Commissioners. My name is Aaron Engstrom. I'm the case planner tasked with, uh, task, uh, with uh, Phase 2B of the Local Coastal Program Update. I have a presentation today. It's about <clears throat> 70 slides long, so I'll scan over some of them and briefly summarize them, but obviously feel free to stop me with any questions that you have. Can we get the slideshow rolling for the, <clears throat> thank you. Let's start at the beginning here. Okay, so there's the cover slide. <clears throat> Overall, uh, phase one occurred early in 2013. Phase two is currently pending a hearing for certification by the Coastal Commission and Phase 2C will be, will, will be finished after this, one, this, this item, and <clears throat> that will wrap up the projects that were required for the Coastal Improvement Assistance Grant that we received to do this work. So today we're looking at wireless communication facilities, civil and administrative penalties, the Coastal Trail, and some reorganization and formatting was done for the CAP. Uh, primarily, the land use maps were all moved in the, consolidated into one chapter, and there were some general statements at the beginning of the CAP, which is the Coastal Area Plan, um, that didn't have any really regulatory um, purpose to them, and so we scanned to see if those were already covered by the policies and programs in the CAP, and removed those general statements just because they may be confusing. confusing. <clears throat> So that was the reorganization. You see that in Exhibit 3. That's the reformatted version of the CAP, Coastal Area Plan. These amendments would apply to the coastal area zone, uh, coastal zone shown in blue here on the maps. Uh, the north coast stretch is relatively thin. Uh, the central coast stretch is uh, sort of unincorporated islands and strips of land amongst the cities of Ventura, Oxnard, and Port Wainimi. And then the south coast, the zone uh, goes inland to en encompass much of the Santa Monica Mountains National Recreation Area. Beginning with wireless facil facilities. <clears throat> so these proposed amendments essentially build upon the non-coastal zoning ordinance standards that were uh, reviewed by you and also adopted by the board in March of last year. Uh, what we did was we also added some provisions and, 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 and standards for consistency with the Coastal Act um, and also melded in requirements for federal law that are based on up updates that were required for federal law. Um, the idea here is that uh, the coastal zoning ordinance right now does not really have any regulations for, this, for the design and siting of wireless facilities and by Im implementing these regulations it will create a level playing field for the permitting of these facilities to be done consistent, consistently every time. <clears throat> the, uh, the basic framework here, and these are some of the items that are the same between the uh, non-coastal version and this version, is that a 10-year conditional use permit is still required for all facilities except for gas meters. And the 10-year permit allows the, these facilities to be re reviewed when they come up for renewal to make sure that they're the least intrusive means uh, to fill a, a, a coverage gap in service. So in, in, in uh, regulating for the least intrusive means, these include development standards and siting standards. So we can regulate for the, the, the design and siting of wireless facilities. 
Um, but we have to allow them to fill a gap in coverage per federal law. <clears throat> the, uh, the baseline requirements and the policies in the coastal zone require stealth design of wireless facilities. So these include the faux trees and faux rocks you see on the left side of the screen. Uh, the trees are modeled after real tree heights to make sure that they blend in with the existing setting. Currently, there are facilities in the right-of-way of the coastal zone that are these flush-mounted antennas you see uh, on the utility poles. That's the most common type of wireless facility found in the coastal zone. They can also be sited on buildings. There's, uh, facilities are concealed in buildings, flush-mounted on buildings, and also included on rooftops. So there's provisions that allow the flexibility there. And then we also clarified uh, that there are slimline poles that are allowed um, in areas such as where a faux tree would be too bulky or block views, we, we have provided allowance for these real slim uh, poles that blend into the existing setting as much as possible. However, <clears throat> sometimes large facilities could be proposed, and so the ordinance takes that into consideration. And these are the traditional non-stealth facilities, which are larger and generally have more aesthetic impact on the surrounding environment. These would still be allowed, but there's a higher level of review for these types of facilities. Going into the standards, as I mentioned, the, the trees, the faux, the faux trees are modeled after real tree heights, the tallest of which would be a pine tree that gets up to 80 feet. It would have to be set in a setting with existing pine trees or pine trees that need to be planted. There's other types of faux facilities. The ones that we would primarily see in the coastal zone are the uh, faux utility poles, such as faux light poles, uh, faux, faux power line poles, and most of the time they're mounted on existing poles, but we also allow new poles uh, if necessary. If the facilities are mounted on a building, it's generally the existing building height with a little bit of wiggle room built in to allow the, the facility to project the, co the coverage out over the surrounding buildings. And <clears throat> Again, the highest height that is allowed by a stealth facility would be 80 feet. So anything over that brings us into that realm of the non-stealth facilities that are, that are taller and require additional review. So as all regulations do, they must be compliant with state and federal laws. And the Telecommunications Act is, that, is the big one that requires the gap in coverage to be filled. Uh, if it's demonstrated that, that, the, that the company, the telecommunications company, needs to provide service in an area, we must allow it, as we would any other utility. <clears throat> uh, the county cannot regulate the placement of these facilities based on radio frequency emissions concerns. And then the third provision of the Telecommunications, telecommunications Act is we cannot discriminate amongst providers. So if Verizon needs to put a tower next to a T-Mobile tower, uh, we cannot make them, we cannot force them to co-locate. We can try to encourage them, but we cannot make them combine them into one tower. <clears throat> the other major one is the Job Creation Act of 2012, Section 6409, requires modifications to facilities after they're developed. The ordinance incorporates some protections in for that as well. <clears throat> then there's a myriad of state laws re related to wireless facilities, but also state laws such as the Coastal Act, and the, the right of utilities companies to use the right-of-way. So that's a utility franchise agreement. Section 6409, the biggest concern about it is that after a facility is permitted and developed, it can be modified through a ministerial permit, which doesn't include CEQA review or, any, or, and it, or conditions of approval. And so the facilities that are on poles today could be increased by 10 feet in height, and standalone facilities could be increased by 20 feet in height. So basically that means that we just have to be extra careful when a 10-year CUP authorizes a new facility. We have to consider up front how it could eventually be modified later down the line for, you know, to impact coastal resources. In response to radio frequency emissions concerns, uh, the planning division does request a radio frequency emissions report with every new facility. That report uh, states whether the facility would be in compliance with the federal standards. The federal standards are already set very high, meaning that uh, the emissions would be one fiftieth of the level uh, which have been demonstrated scientifically to cause harmful impacts. And 
If necessary, the, we, we reserve the option to call in a third party review a technical expert to look at that RF report to verify that it's done correctly, you know, remodel it, things like that. <clears throat> we also have a map that we're, that's ready to be posted on the planning division website, which shows the, where the wireless facilities are today in the county, including the coastal zone. And so if someone is really concerned about these, they can try to avoid the areas that they're in. This map also is useful to demonstrate where the facilities are today in the coastal zone. You can see the Central Coast area doesn't really have very many wireless facilities in the unincorporated area. We're not showing the ones in cities. That's out of our jurisdiction. The North Coast and the South Coast, most of the facilities are located in the rights away A couple are located up on, the, up on the hillsides. May I interrupt you there? Sure. Could you go back to that? Yeah. Um, is there a key for uh, the, you've got little stars and little, Circles. Yeah, so uh, that was the different uh, providers uh, that were in there, and we're, we're probably going to take those off and just have the blue dots, which represent <clears throat> the planning division and the EHD permits for the facilities. <clears throat> and what we'd like to do is also add in some of the right-of-way permits for the facilities, so that's why we need to have a couple more blue dots here just to clarify that some of these are, are, right, are rights-of-way facilities and then consolidate that information. Right now we just have the planning division permits load it up into it. And, and where is this found if you're just in the general This will public? be included on the planning division website before the board of supervisors hearing. We'll, we can go public with it then. Okay, thank you. Okay. <clears throat> thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. So I discussed some of the similarities between the proposed amendments for wireless facilities, but now I'm going to discuss some of the differences between the non-coastal zone version and the coastal zone version. So in order to achieve compliance with the Coastal Act, there's additional standards for access, visual resources, um, <clears throat> but also the uh, coastal zone applies to the public right-of-way. So as the as, as the planning division is tasked with uh, implementing the certified local coastal program, we also uh, regulate the rights away. So that's a new set of standards that are included in this version. New policies would protect uh, public views, hillsides, uh, sensitive envir environmental areas, and maintain coastal access. That's included in the new policies. So, so there's, uh, I think, four policies that are included under the scenic resources section of the, of the coastal area plan. This also complements the uh, policy that was already included in the general plan to blend these facilities as much as possible during the last round of updates. And then the bulk of the amendments are the these, are these standards and the new standards um, again, emphasize visual resources, the eligible scenic highways in the area. And if a company does not provide a stealth design facility, then we, we will require them to uh, demonstrate that the federal preemption is necessary, which is typically the facilities needed to fill a gap in coverage. <clears throat> So in the, in the rights away, we will see some of these gas meters being deployed. Uh, if they're mounted on an existing pole, they're, they're basically a small solar panel and a couple of very small whip antennas for very minor impacts. Um, they can be allowed through a zoning clearance. A new pole would be a planned development permit. Uh, we also clarified that the rights away do allow stealth wireless facilities. <clears throat> And the use matrix was updated um, to reflect that the planning director will hear stealth facilities instead of every new facility, facility being brought forth to the planning commission. That's how it would be done today. And <clears throat> it would, they would also be allowed in some new zones. So let's skip Excuse over me, here sir. to the use matrix. Yes, sir. Uh, planning director approved. Uh, usual appeal rights involved there too? Did yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> the revised use matrix shows that, you know, the, the, the old line for wireless communication facilities included, you know, the, the major zones, the coastal open space and agricultural zones, you know, comprise most of the land in the coastal zone. 
Um, but some of the other large lot rural areas would be allowed, would allow stealth facilities. Uh, this is consistent with coastal policies, which is to direct new development near existing development and also provide service to those areas. And then non-stealth facilities would still be heard by your commission. <clears throat> and these are these gas meters as well that could be deployed through a zoning clearance on existing poles in the right-of-way. The idea here is that these gas meters don't have the exponential demand that wireless facilities do. Therefore, there would be a one-time deployment um, and, and that would be it. So there wouldn't be needed to add additional capacity or technology onto those facilities. <clears throat> so that's the new structure. And some of the design standards were updated. So I mentioned the slimline poles. There's another picture of one. Ideally, it would be painted to blend in better. Um, the location of equipment boxes was specified a little bit in a little bit more detail for the coastal zone because if they're mounted on the poles, they further um, can impact views from, from scenic highways. Uh, the application requirements, we clarified that not everything is required every single time. So if it's a facility that's a stealth small facility, it has a more streamlined review process than, a, for instance, a large non-stealth facility. <clears throat> And also zoning clearances are allowed for some types of facility modifications that, are, that weren't specified before in the coastal zoning ordinance. The overall hierarchy here is that a proposed facility that would be 50 feet or less, there's lots of options to be able to do a stealth design for those. So therefore, the standards essentially require anything under 50 feet to be designed as a stealth facility. In 50 to 81 feet, um, Essentially, the only type of stealth facility there is would be a faux tree. And like I mentioned earlier, that may not be suitable for all instances, such as a, a bulky tree can block uh, public views or uh, may not be suitable with the landscaping and the soil to plant other trees around it. And so there is the option to do a non-stealth facility in that case. And if a facility is over 80 feet, it's non-stealth, but still should be painted or sited to conceal it as much as possible. <clears throat> Any non-stealth facility requires this Telecommunications over, uh, Act uh, override to be demonstrated that the facility needed to fill that gap in coverage. And, um, and that would entail alternative sites analysis, review of propagation diagrams. I'll show you one in a minute. And one of the, one of the items need, that need to be demonstrated is that one or more smaller facilities cannot be built instead of one large facility. So that would minimize the aesthetic impacts, although it would be potentially be costly, more costly for the applicant. <clears throat> One of the other tools that we are proposing to direct the siting of these facilities is the preferred, non-preferred, and restricted locations. The preferred and non-preferred are included in the non-coastal zoning ordinance. But we added the restricted locations here. <clears throat> the preferred locations include facilities mounted on existing structures. So co-location, these the small panel antennas added onto existing facilities flush mounted, and in the right of way um, would be basically a lot of the two above as well. Um, within a grove of trees, hidden behind trees, building concealed or clustered when the clustering of the facilities would reduce coastal impacts, such as additional access roads or the need for fire clearance. The non-preferred and the restricted locations basically include habitat beaches, hillsides and, and hilltops and ridgelines, as well as historic sites. So the way it works is the higher standard of review is done for restricted location facilities and large non-stealth facilities over 80 feet. In that instance, we would uh, use every available tool to verify that those facilities are necessary, which would include the alternative sites analysis, uh, the demonstrated coverage gap per the Telecommunications Act, which is the propagation diagrams, and we would also verify that information through third-party technical review. This is an important addition compared to the non-coastal zone um, because it basically gives us the tools to uh, bring in an RF engineer to evaluate these really complicated reports that we don't have the ability to do in-house. <clears throat> you see at the top here the preferred locations it's a much more streamlined application submittal process. And in that sense, um, 
the ordinance encourages the development or I guess doesn't encourage it, but it allows a, a quicker review process for facilities in a preferred location compared to the facilities that we don't want to see. <clears throat> the proposed regulation of the CZO provide, um, I mentioned a lot of this already, the planning director approval and the streamlined review for stealth. And the non-stealth would go to the planning commission still. And you'd have a chance to look at all of that information. And sometimes we would have technical experts to assist you in those matters. <clears throat> we did receive one comment letter in response to the ordinance, and that was from Verizon. And basically, uh, the right-of-way ordinance is, uh, is, is a, was implemented by the Public Works Agency Transportation Department a few years ago. And that provides standards for the placement of, of facil wireless facilities in the right-of-way. <clears throat> and, um, and it, but it's the right of way in the non-coastal zone and the coastal zone, and so they're somewhat general. And what we think is that the, our proposed amendments today are more prescriptive than that. And Verizon had some issues with it. They would prefer that they have these small cells, which are essentially those flush-mounted panel antennas, be allowed to be deployed uh, through a ministerial zoning clearance. Uh, they also did not want to put uh, equipment boxes on the ground if they could be located on poles and they have the opinion that the propagation diagram should not be required when facilities are deployed in the rights away uh, in response to the, the to the comments um, <clears throat> basically as the certified lcp it's like i mentioned it's more detailed than the right away standards um, and having the certified document we have to make sure that it's consistent with the coastal act and basically the analysis cannot uh, the coastal consistency analysis that we conducted in Exhibit 7 could not verify that deployment of these small cell antennas through a zoning clearance would be consistent with the Coastal Act because federal law allows them to be modified to be 10 feet or taller or 6 feet wider through another zoning clearance. So it would be a dangerous precedent to allow uh, these small facilities up front through a zoning clearance without any review and then allow them to be modified again without additional review uh, to block public view sheds, views of the ocean, and things like that. So it's within our police powers to regulate the, uh, you know, the, and regulate and protect the scenic values of the coastal zone. <clears throat> and right, exercise authority over the time, place, and manner of the development in the right-of-way, and that's been determined by the courts. So the other responses are that um, equipment boxes should not be located on the poles. It should be located on the ground to not clutter the poles and to preserve the views as much as possible, unless the poles are in ESHA, which is, would be sensitive habitat. In that case, to avoid the need for fire clearance, they could be located towards, up towards the bottom of the poles. That's the proposal. And the propagation diagrams would not be required if uh, for facilities under 30 feet within the right of way, but we do reserve the right to request those facilities because pursuant to federal law, they have to demonstrate a gap in coverage, and the way that that's demonstrated is through those propagation diagrams, so we need to see them sometimes. This is what one of them looks like. Uh, the little red dot is a proposed facility, and the colors show the intensity of the capacity of the, of the coverage and basically gets increased and fills the, the, the holes in the coverage uh, which are shown on the, on the white background of the map. And so that's what we review and at different heights those colors will change, they'll increase and decrease and, uh, and also with more facilities, you know, so we could look at, you know, two facilities and see how that would compare to the coverage of this one facility mm -hmm. and, and do those types of analyses in-house to some extent when you get multiple iterations of these diagrams for the alternative sites analysis, then we could also call in a third party if needed to make sure that the modeling was done correctly. I think that is my, that is the wireless facility section. Um, we Bef can pause for comments or we can just keep going. Before, before you move on, I do have a question. Are there any other questions? <laughs> No, at this point? No. I had one. Um, I can't recall if it was in the staff report or whether it was actually in the um, 
in the ordinance, uh, it used capacity and coverage uh, interchangeably. And there is a distinction. And I think that, um, uh, that I wondered uh, why that was, that they're used interchangeably because they are not the same. Right. So, I mean, there's different interpretations uh, from, from different attorneys as to whether or not the Telecommunications Act and that gap in coverage applies just to the, the, uh, the coverage, which shows those gaps in those diagrams, or whether it also applies to the capacity, which is the intensity and the ability to provide the service to more people at the same time. And uh, I think our interpretation is that it applies to both. Okay, I disagree with that interpretation very strongly because um, one of the tools that you, uh, there's a lot of preemption, so there's very little that uh, the county can do in, in um, you know, rolling out this service. And one of the things, one of the tools that the county has is this distinction, this preemption on coverage, and we are not preempted on capacity. I think that's a, a mistake. Also, um, that was one point. The... Um, there was another uh, section that I found troubling, and it had to do with um, if there was an existing structure, you couldn't add to the width of the structure. Does that mean like six inches? You couldn't add six inches to the structure? You could, was there uh, like an absolute? <clears throat> yeah, the, the reason for that was, I guess, for one thing, you don't want to, you know, we, the wireless facility should, should blend in with the building and be like a cupola or a steeple or a, you know some sort of a, a mansard or something that conceals the facility and, and should blend in with the existing architectural features. Uh, we don't want one that hangs off the edge of the building. But you know the reason for that provision is primarily to protect against potential modifications that could be required per that federal law, that 6409 law that could allow the facility to expand on a building six feet out. And so essentially, um, having that provision in there, we think helps to solidify the standards so that we could enact the, the, the provision that says the concealment elements should not be defeated per that federal modification. And so the concealment elements would include not widening the width of the building through a zoning clearance. And so that's one of those, I was built into that order, the proposed amendments to protect against those potential egregious modifications. Thanks, thanks for that clarification. The last thing has to do with uh, faux trees. And um, explain the thinking why a faux eucalyptus is in no case allowable in the coastal zone. This seems um, pretty silly. Yeah, it was an interesting turn of events in this process. But <clears throat> essentially, the, a, a faux eucalyptus um, a, 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 a faux tree could be planted in a grove of existing eucalyptus, but no new eucalyptus trees are allowed to be planted in the coastal zone because they're an invasive species. And so therefore, to avoid that confusion about, um, they would have to do a different type of tree in a grove of faux eucalyptus, or, and they would not be able to do a new eucalyptus tree because it would, if, if no trees were around it, because it would require planting of eucalyptus trees to conceal the facility and make it blend in. Uh, so we, did, we took out the faux eucalyptus. There's the faux pine, which is still 80 feet. But it was, I don't know if that was a very good explanation. But it was, <coughs> would you like to add anything? To that? I think the only thing I would add, um, Commissioner, is um, what I recall is that when we uh, reviewed that provision with the Coastal Commission staff, they actually preferred that we not include eucalyptus. They are fake trees. Nevertheless, they were somewhat sensitive to the fact that they, they are an invasive species. I guess you could say the whole thing, you know, all of wireless telecommunication facilities are invasive. <laughs> I mean, if you want to look at it that way. I just thought that uh, that stood out to me. Um, given that eucalyptus trees can grow to enormous heights and our native palm only grows to 60, mm -hmm. um, and probably the worst 
uh, uh, installation that I've approved here and then found out afterwards, oh, that was a mistake, was one where there was a palm tree that sticks above the other palm trees by a significant amount. It just sticks out like a sore thumb. So it doesn't, uh, mm -hmm. it doesn't meet the goals of, of stealthing the facility at all. Mm -hmm. That's all I had. Any other questions at this point? Okay. All right. You got 45 minutes before we shake things up. Big pardon. Oh, I forgot about that. Okay, I'll try to. We got the great shake out. Wrap it up by then here. Hopefully. Yeah. So the. You got a duck and cover. Oh. The proposed amendments for the building land use code are similar to the wireless facility amendments in the sense that. These are already a board adopted regulations that are implemented in the non coastal zoning ordinance as well as the building, Ventura County Building Code. And they're just being carried forth over the coastal zoning ordinance now that we have the opportunity to do so. These, are, these regulations are used by both the planning division and the code enforcement division under the directive of the planning director to, to uh, resolve vi I mean, abate violations. <coughs> Um, the code enforcement division would use them the most frequently. The, plan, the planning division, uh, both, both sections, both departments respond to citizen complaints about land uses. And the planning division primarily focuses on the ones that are complaints about discretionary permits, discretionary land uses. And the code compliance division deals with the buy right land uses. And both divisions investigate and, and seek to abate the violations through some of the tools that are included in these proposed amendments. The planning division reviews permits uh, for compliance every three years. And they also do it more often if there's CEQA mitigation measures that are required as a condition for the permit. <clears throat> and Excuse me, sir. Yes, sir. Are you saying that all conditional use permits are reviewed on a three-year basis? That is the goal. That's the goal, but that. that has not been what happened. The, the, the goal is to do it on a three-year basis. It may or may not be exactly three years. Well, obviously, so, we've had many permits before us that have expired. Uh, and I assume the planning director had, had a program to clarify those issues and make sure that doesn't happen, or she talked of it. We do. So, uh, Commissioner Onstadt, just to be clear on that, you know, we have antiquated permits, permits that were issued in the 40s, 50s, 60s, right? And then we have newer permits, right? And permits for some time, maybe 25 years or so, have had the condition in them or it's been in the ordinance that's saying no less than once every three years you'll review the, the permits. And we do have um, staff in our planning department that that's all they do, right? They pull those permits, they take a look, they, they contact um, the uh, permit holder, they go out, they do a review. So that doesn't mean all of the permits are being done because there's certain vested rights that the older permittees have. Um, but we do review the ones that we have the authority to review at this time. But we are looking into the, into the question of, of reviewing all of the permits. Thank but, you, ma'am. Thank you. <clears throat> Some of the typical violations that code enforcement seeks to abate include open storage, um, illegal businesses and zones that don't allow it. Another example would be you know, too many farm animals in the residential zones. Unpermitted buildings and illegal dwellings are all frequently occurring violations that are not tied to a permit per se. And so those are investigated upon complaint by the code, by, by the code enforcement department. Uh, <clears throat> overall, the important thing to emphasize is that the proposed amendments are, have been tr tried and true, have been demonstrated to be more effective than what we have now in the Coastal Zoning Ordinance today. And so one example is the maintenance of wireless facilities to ensure that, the, you know, that they're kept up to date and blend in as much as possible. Another example was a, apparently a giant unpermitted uh, compost pile was removed and abated. And so some of these are serious health violations, right? These can be have fumes, um, runoff, things like that. 
And so the proposed amendments specifically, <clears throat> you know, they specify the who, what, where, when, and how much of the, are the code violations. Uh, what are the steps involved? What is the appeal process? And, you know, the county also has the right to, uh, to proceed to civil courts on a separate track to also abate violations in addition to the proposed amendments and these programs. <clears throat> Overall, the framework and the programs is different between code compliance and the planning division, but the main parts are the same. Generally speaking, there's a warning letter uh, sent out. Uh, it could be an email for the planning division that described that there's a, there could be a violation you know, on this person's property or associated with, with this person's permit. Now, that warning for the planning division may threaten to revoke the permit if the violation is not abated, and that usually works 99% of the time. Um, the, the code compliance division you know, provides a courtesy notice as well in 30 days to abate the violation. <clears throat> now, the notice of violation, once that's issued, that starts the staff billing process so they can bill time to resolving the case. Excuse me, sir. Yes, sir. Is the notice of violation recorded at the county recorder's office? That would be the notice of, uh, the notice of noncompliance is recorded at the county recorder's office. Does the notice that goes out to the permittee and or the property owner, in many cases the, the permittee is not the property owner, does the property owner get noticed? Because I think he would clean, or she would clean it up, probably assist you in that regard. Yeah, the, do we have Jim and the, Jim, are you? Jim is more familiar with the exact specifications of the process, so if you guys, I can, thank you, Jim. Uh, Jim Delperding, Code Compliance. Um, uh, Aaron's right. We uh, send a notice of violation, and it goes to the property owner. Okay. Um, if we're aware of a tenant, we will oftentimes send it to both. Uh, but I agree with you. Um, sending it to the owner is a lot more effective. Yes. Uh, they'll, they'll generally police their tenant, especially when their financial consequences tied uh, to their not complying. Thank you, sir. And the, the penalties are imposed at the end of the process at the notice of imposition of civil and administrative penalties. So that's when the civil penalties start accruing uh, up to $1,000 a day, depending on the severity of the violation. <clears throat> Some of the differences between the two, you know, the ordinance, the proposed amendments allow flexibility here, so that's why you see the, the differences in the two programs. Um, and so the notice of noncompliance is recorded at different times amongst the two programs. Um, and you know, one is with the notice of violation, and one allows an extra 30 day period to resolve it. <clears throat> and uh, it also allows some of these notices to be sent together or separately. Uh, the, Important, the, the ordinance specifies the, the time frame for the notice of impending penalties to have to begin 30 days um, after the period for correction. So 30 days is the only time frame for the uh, notice of impending penalties included in the ordinance. The other time periods are flexible uh, based on the way the programs are administered. So sometimes it's 30 days, sometimes it may be more than 30 days. A lot of it depends on the severity of the violation. And so that's the basic summary of those proposed. Sure. At what point do we talk about compliance agreements? Well, <clears throat> the compliance agreements can be entered into, I believe, after the notice of violation. Um, and, and any, you know, it's flexible when, when those can be entered into. And those are frequently entered into um, as a solution instead of, you know, imposing the penalties. Is there usually a bond involved or cash? penalty for failure to comply? Um, Mr. Onstott, there is always a cash penalty or a bond involved in case we don't get action. So it's a tool that the, the planning director or um, Mr. Delperdang as the planning director's designee can um, utilize and we do that often and we set very tight timelines. So for instance, we'll take in a $10,000 bond and we'll say, you need to have a complete application submitted on June 1st, and then you need to have your approvals done by you know, July 31st, right. and you need to have everything in place. And so each one of those milestones 
comes with a penalty, sometimes a thousand, sometimes two thousand dollars to really gain quick compliance when there is a violation occurring where they need an entitlement to abate that violation. So it, we almost always okay. take in some typical funds. like we saw in the mining operations. Pardon me? Like we saw in the mining operations appear in front of us. Did you not have compliance agreements? Well, the mining operation, yeah, we, we had compliance yeah. agreements on those too, but the mining operations have a complete separate set of financial assurances to make sure that the mining um, is brought into compliance, even if the operator failed to do so, which we had that case. Right. Um, so we, we have a separate set of financial assurances to make sure that that occurs. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, piggybacking on that, I'm aware of a situation that I'm not sure is um, whether this uh, coastal ordinance covers. It's on the backside of Caneo Mountain. Do you know the case to which I'm referring? Then I'll talk about it another time. On to the coastal trail. <clears throat> this is the final item that is in the proposed amendments for today. And thank you, Jim, for coming in. <clears throat> It has a so the the state um, has tried its plan for the coastal trail since the inception of the coastal act in the 70s. In 2003, it released a report. The state coastal conservancy released a report about completing the coastal trail. It defined it as such on the slide, um, which includes a definition of a non-motorized continuous right of way, meaning from Mexico to Oregon along the California coastline beaches, and. There's a little bit of emphasis added for hiking. It talks about hiking specifically and then calls out other complementary modes of non-motorized transportation. This is consistent with the guidance we received from Coastal Commission staff of to make sure that we provide a hiking and walking facility. <clears throat> there, are, there are challenges with planning a trail on the beach in the coastal zone. Obviously, their beaches are inconsistent. Uh, there's rocky cliffs. There's developed areas. The land is scarce. Land is expensive. And there's not a you know, statewide funding initiative to help local governments provide for these facilities. So there's a lot of challenges involved. <clears throat> Overall, the state looks to develop a braided network of trails. So uh, a beach could be included in one area. A bike lane could also run parallel to that beach for cyclists. Equestrians can be included, mountain bikers. Uh, and so the ultimate goal is a sort of a network of trails that go along the coast for users. <clears throat> the proposed amendments today are basically at a very high level. We don't have the resources right now to go into the detailed design and planning efforts uh, for the coastal trail itself, but this is a first step. And so what we propose are uh, trail classifications and include maps in the narrative showing where the trail exists and where it's planned for improvements. And goals, policies, and programs are typical components of the area plan and the general plan documents. There were also minor amendments required to the coastal access and recreation sections on the north, central, and south coast. While a comprehensive update is needed for those sections, those are beyond the scope of this project, but we did basically update, uh, well, there's a slide coming up for that one. <clears throat> so the coastal trail consists of this multimodal route, which is this core backbone route. It, it basically follows the Pacific Coast bike route through the county, and that one was already adopted by the board as part of the Ventura Transportation Commission uh, countywide bicycle plan. And so we, we seek to build off of that and provide connectivity along the entire coastline but there's an inherent challenge there, whereas the facilities along that route are for cyclists and not as much for hikers and walkers. So we have to try to balance those two needs. Uh, that's done by providing additional single mode routes that provide ingre egress and ingress back into this main multimodal route. And those single mode routes that loop off include hiking trails, the beaches that are passable generally during all times of the year. And uh, there's some other interesting examples. Excuse me, sir. Yes, sir. Do we have maps, a map or maps that show beach access uh, along the? Yeah, we have some maps coming up, and we label the beach access points, parking areas, and things like that in the coastal trail maps that were included in Exhibit Three. Does that include vertical and lateral access? 
Yeah, it specifies uh, mostly the vertical access points and the lateral access points are, you know, that are. These are existing, correct? Existing, yes. We yeah. build upon existing public lands and public access easements in this stage of the project. It's too early to propose new ones. So once again, how did you identify the vertical and lateral access to the beach along the 34 miles? Well, we relied on the existing coastal area plan, um, other documents, the maps that accommodated this report included it, uh, just uh, the best available information. But you, the maps that were provided to us, do they or do they not show the vertical and the yeah, it's it's the little icon of the of the little wave icon. It's it's it'll be it'll show better on some of the color copies, um, which will I can skip okay. ahead to. Thank you. See the little icons there. Yes. So those are the vertical access points, and then we also label parking and things like that. It's not a uh, it's not a regulatory uh, delineation of where the access points are. It's just a summary of existing conditions. Do, do the maps indicate any proposed additions? No, uh, it's just existing. Are there? there there's, a, there's a couple of items that are in the pipeline, McGrath State Beach, Ormond State Beach, which are you know undergoing design and restoration efforts. And so in, in that sense, the coastal trail is, is in, would be included in those projects, but everything else is an existing uh, easement or existing public land. Are, the, are those state parks? Yeah, those are state parks. So it's easier, I assume, to work with the state than would be private individuals. Well, well, maybe. Yeah. Okay. Well, or or Ormond Beach is technically the city of Oxnard, and the Nature Conservancy and the Coastal Conservancy are, are primarily involved in that effort. <clears throat> What's the interrelation with the federal facilities? Do we have a working relationship with them? Well, we were in contact with the Navy base uh, over the segment of the trail that traverses near the fence line there. And so we have authorization to include that area. Uh, we also were in contact with the National Park Service, and they have an integrated trail plan update that's underway. And so we will hope to build off of that and consolidate efforts for that um, to include trails in the San Monica Mountains that can be used as the coastal trail alternates. and. Uh, but yeah, it's mostly county and, and state lands that are designated in the plan today. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. So the, multi, the multimodal, let's see, <clears throat> all right, explain that one. The multimodal routes are, 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 are split up into shared and versus separated routes. So some areas, the cyclists and the walkers would use the same you know, pathway, class one pathway. In other instances, there could be a separation where there's a soft shoulder for hikers or equestrians. Single mode routes, you know, we generally consider the beaches being appropriate for hikers at this point, as well as the trail, a lot of the trails in Point Magoo and other hiking trails would be uh, for walkers. And then there's some areas like around the Navy base where there's just a bike lane and there isn't enough shoulder to add in a hiking trail. And so those would be the single mode routes dedicated for a specific user group. Going into the maps here, we have seven maps that are included in Exhibit 3 of the CAP. Um, those were designed with help of Rashida Kadakia in the planning division. And the first map is an overview map, and it shows this route traversing the entire uh, county coastal zone. It goes out of the coastal zone for one little segment here around the base. And it provides that real connectivity that's, that the state is looking for. The overview map also shows uh, the keys to what the, uh, the subsequent more detailed maps show. So it provides sort of a legend or a, a, or a starting point for, to see what else is shown. Um, again, it's built off of the Pacific Coast bike route. In more detailed segments here, I'll walk you through briefly from north to south uh, what we have. And... <clears throat> It's divided into main segments. So this north part is between these two brown boxes here is segment N1. And, and that is that new uh, Caltrans HOV bike lane that was recently built. And arguably, it's the best example of a completed segment of the coastal trail in the county today. It's a brand new multimodal facility right along the coastline. 
and <clears throat> then it goes, there's also beaches included. So we include La, La Conchita Beach, Rincon Point, and Beacons Beach, also sometimes called the Mobile Pier Beach. And, and generally, those are the beaches that are past, that have sand most of the year, so they can be, and there's also an egress and a, an, a area to get onto it and an area to get off of it in a continuous through route going through the county. Segment N2 is about, four, uh, N1 is about four miles, and it goes into N2, which is old PCH there, the Rincon Parkway. Um, an interesting example that is also included is a trail that's on a seawall revetment at the Seacliff Beach Colony. And so that's a good example of how the coastal trail can be developed in the future in response to sea level rise. What, what county agencies assume responsibility for maintenance and repair and liability for damages? On segment N1, it's uh, Caltrans is responsible for the maintenance of that trail. If, if Caltrans uh, includes the trail in, in highway facilities, oftentimes they assume responsibility for the maintenance of it. But that's definitely an ongoing question for the segments that are included on county roads. And there is not an agency. There are agencies that have, you know, that do maintain county trails here, that, such as the Ventura River Trail. Um, but this project does not assign an agency the maintenance of it. So no one's point. assumed responsibility or liability for the maintenance and repair. No <clears throat> well, agency as as yet. Well, there's there's so there's a couple state laws that basically um, uh, basically uh, exonerate or uh, uh, Jeff, would you like to? That's a good legal question. Yeah, I think that <laughs> at this point in the process, the, the, the point is um, we're, not, we're not implementing a formal trail. And so the, the county isn't saying, all right, we're responsible for the whole trail or any other specific agency is. And so it's kind of the status quo, what agency or private property owns you know, the, the land where the, tr where the designated trail currently exists. And well, so if it's I'm, I'm on looking the side at this, this trail on the seawall, and I'm sure that those property owners own past that seawall. I, I forget what the measuring is, but is that or is that not a county trail? It's not a county trail. It's, it's that, that portion of the trail, and you'll be hearing from the Seacliff Colony property owners, um, and yeah, you know, they'll, they'll chime in, but um, the county's understanding there is that the, that public lateral access route was established in a deed restriction, um, which requires the, the Seacliff HOA to maintain that lateral access. Okay, so there's a, in your opinion, okay, I can understand that. In other areas, though, where we have, well. If, if a part of a trail goes through a, a county park or if it goes on the shoulder of a county maintained road, then the county would be the default. You know, if someone got hurt, we could get sued over it. Um, as Aaron mentioned, we have trail immunities and, you know, once you get into the civil legal process and we'd have defenses, but I think the, the bottom line right now is, is whatever, like I said, whatever public agency or private party owns the land, that's probably the party who's most responsible right now. And, that, and the vertical access points where you're passing through private property, you're saying that's the responsibility of whom? Th that would depend on the instrument that created the, the easement. And so, well, if it was a discretionary permit. Right, and it would depend on if a, if a public agency accepted the, the vertical access easement, and then I'm assuming the public agency would be responsible, but there could also be scenarios where the Coastal Commission required, for instance, an HOA to be the responsible party. So you'd have to look at the legal instrument that created the, the access, right? Well, could any of these easements, vertical easements, come into being without... The the county or some governmental agency having responsibility for maintenance, repair, liability? Theoretically, and I haven't looked at all of them, but theoretically you could have a prescriptive easement that someone's established through the legal process. And um, so you just have to look at, you know, the, the court documents that establish that to... But that's not a public right of way, unless it's unless you get a court order to that effect. It, it, right, that's right. My exactly. point, my question is, can we have one of these easements, a vertical easement, that gets you to the coastline without some entity taking responsibility for it, and other than the homeowner or property owner? Existing? Yes. Um, 
I, that's a good question. I, I, someone would be responsible. Well, one of the problems I had with this, with this program or, or the documents that I read, that was I, I didn't understand that or the liability that attaches to it. I mean, here we're saying we are going to or can compel through discretionary permit process the dedication of easement if you want to build whatever it is you want to build. Right. But you better take responsibility for it then. No, and that's, yeah, I mean, go, going forward, we, we would have someone taking responsibility. And the existing easements, again, I haven't looked at them, but I'm assuming most of them assign a responsible party. But you'd, again, you'd have to look at each each instrument, each vertical access, um, separately, and to, to identify the responsible party. Well, have we identified uh, potential public easements by prescription? That's not part of this project, no. But we've provided for it in the documents in case they exist. We can we can pursue them, and the attorney general can pursue them. Correct. That's what it says. Correct. Right. Yeah. But we're in, in, when you we're talking about prescriptive easements, we're, we're looking, like you said, at, at prescriptive easements that have been perfected through a court order. I've got a lot of questions. Okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead. All right. I think it would be good to add, too, that there were minor amendments to the Coastal Zoning Ordinance provisions for how an easements, public access easements, are conveyed to the county and how they can be transferred to other third-party agencies. Uh, nonprofit agencies and public agencies if they do want to maintain the facilities. So vertical access easements generally require more maintenance than lateral access easements that are, that are along a beach, right? There's not a lot of maintenance on a beach, so that's low-hanging fruit. Um, but we did uh, allow, allow more flexibility in this offer to dedicate program that allowed direct conveyance of the easement to the county, and the county can transfer it to another agency within five years in order to, op to improve it, open it, and maintain it. And sometimes, you know, um, like the Nature Conservancy or other nonprofit agencies can step in and help with the maintenance of, of the easements. Well, help with the maintenance and liability and responsibility or something else. The Coastal Zoning Ordinance now says the only way you're going to get it is an offer to dedicate, and the amendments change that to a discretionary and, and other legal means. I guess I would just clarify that the, the offer to dedicate is... I mean, it's essentially the same as a conveyance of an easement, but... Um, no, it's way, not. Well, the property owner is offering to give it to an agency, but an agency doesn't necessarily have to step up right away, and so the offer just can sit there for 25 years. No, I understand that. I do. Okay. But you're changing that and doing away with that to hopefully use the discretionary permit process, basically, to compel some property owner to dedicate. Well... The offer, it's a standing offer, and so the, the, the change, I guess, it, in my mind, it's a clarification. If the county, um, the, instead of just having an offer sit there for, for numerous years, the, the county can instead step up right away and say, okay, we're going to take the easement right now because we want to implement it right away. And so the, the change is a way, a mechanism, basically, for the county to try to get the easement into use quicker. Well, I understand what you're saying, but most people are going to not want to voluntarily give up part of their valuable property, especially along a coastline, so you're going to end up taking it. No, we're not. No, I mean, right. we, I, I know it's not condemnation, but the same, you know, if the guy can't build unless he grants you the 10-foot easement or whatever it is, he's going to do it. And the, the county, the, nothing in the planning documents based on my review compels or even suggests the county will um, have to take um, property rights from any property owner where there's not a constitutional nexus and rep proportionality allowing us to do that. Well, maybe you better explain what the, uh, what the, in order for a discretionary permit condition to require the dedication of an easement, what kind of showing has to be made? You know, that's a good question. And the best example, and, and that's one of the reasons why the, the mapping is useful, the, the best example would be if a discretionary project um, blocked a, an existing portion of the coastal trail. And so the, the property owner is basically taking out part of the trail where public access currently exists. Then there would be a nexus, presumably a nexus, to um, require the property owner to allow the, the county or some other public agency to reroute the trail around the property 
or otherwise just deny the, the project outright. So that's the best example. I understand what you're saying, but I don't think that's practical what will happen. If, if I may chime in, too, the, so the approach here of including the, the trail on existing easements and existing public lands um, basically prescribes that when the parks, state parks come in for a permit for a for redesign of a park, which will be happening, and also when road improvements occur, that's also a discretionary permitting process that we can ask for the trail to be included in those projects. But it does not show the trail ending at any private you know, fences or anything like that. And so the language that's in there is requ essentially required to be included in, in most trail planning documents. And it simply uh, builds upon or does not further the existing lateral and, and vertical access easement language that's already in the coastal uh, plan and access and recreation sections. There's already language in there for, for, for obtaining those easements through uh, discretionary development, coastal development permits. Do any of these proposed lateral or vertical e or lateral easements dead end? I, I read some, there was some input from some member of the public saying it stops uh, at the end of their property or something to that effect, in which case, then what? Do you expect the person traversing it to go all the way back or are they gonna trespass on people's property? I, mean, I thought it was a good point. Yeah, it's a good, it's a fair point. And that's that, you know, that seawall there and that you'll hear that point again today and that's the trail and the sea cliff property there where um, it looks like, and there's a slide on this, but it looks like it's intended by the Coastal Commission uh, during their authorization of the permit for that seawall to include a complete lateral easement that extends from uh, through, through the whole seawall along the whole front of the property. However, there are some ex improvements that would be needed to do that. And so these property owners contend that the trail is actually meant to be a seasonal trail and maybe passable during low tides or when there's enough sand on the beach to go around those obstacles that need improvements. And so that's one of the issues um, that was included in the comment letters and was addressed. But just because a facility is not passable at all times of the year doesn't mean it should be excluded from the coastal trail. But, um, but so we include the seasonal beaches as shown on these maps. But for the official designated segments, we try to just focus on uh, what is passable during you know, all times of the year to make sure it's safe for the users mm -hmm. when they use these, if they use these maps or, you know. Commissioner Onstott, we specifically focused on through routes for this trail, not dead end routes. If there's any dead end routes on there, <clears throat> and there might be one or two, they're on large public beaches. Oh like Hollywood Beach or Silver Strand Beach. We absolutely focused on through routes. If there's a, an interim condition where it's um, planned to be through but isn't currently through, we indicated that in the plan. We have tables under every single map that identifies when a trail needs improvements and doesn't. If it doesn't need improvements, then it's available today. But if it needs improvements, it simply isn't available today. It's part of the future plan, but improvements would need to be made to make sure that that's a through route. Okay, thank you. Okay. Before we go on, I just want to step way back. Um, could we get some um, clarification from the County Council regarding the Coastal Act and uh, and what precipitated this whole effort for a coastal trail isn't isn't the beach isn't the 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 beach held in trust for the public and that was the whole purpose of the coastal act and uh, the the vision for a coastal trail that everybody would be able to walk along a beach if it's there um, uh, you know at the mean high tide That's correct. Yeah, the, all, all the beaches in California are, are owned by the public and the public trust. And so the, the, and that, that, that has its basis in the Coastal Act, as you said. And then um, even to supplement that, the state legislature passed uh, another law amending the Coastal Act to, to basically say, as a state, we want um, all local jurisdictions to help us implement this coastal trail, like you said, so people can enjoy 
the entire coastline. And so um, that, that was tasked on all cities and counties, and so that's why we're building this into an element of our um, local coastal program. But um, for, for clarification's sake, what we're approving here is a concept for a multimodal improved trail, not specifically um, a, a, a plan that says you will be able to walk you know, from Oregon down to Mexico. Right, we're just looking at, at, at the coastal trail route in, in Ventura County. And as Aaron's describing, when, when you look at the actual trail, there, there's different components of it. There's a multimodal trail, but then the maps also show, you know, as we've been discussing, um, vertical and lateral access points to the beach. And so, um, yeah, when, when you're looking down at specific segments, it's, it's more complicated than just saying, all right, here's our trail going down our stretch of the coast. And, and I, it, you know, it would be great if it were that simple, but it, it's not, you know, based on private property rights, based on the condition of the beaches. And so it's a really challenging project. Yeah, I'm, I'm really interested in the condition of the beach, what with global warming and rising, you know, ocean levels, uh, what, that, what that even means, you know. Um, but the fact remains that the public has the right to walk on the beach at the mean high tide. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. Right. Thank you. There's a picture of the new bike path on the north coast. That's the first major segment of the coastal trail. The next segment is N2, and that's old PCH. That's a seven mile stretch. And that includes the existing class two bike lane the plan would propose to include basically a, either con convert that into a uh, class one pathway similar to the new bike path or include a natural surface trail on the side of the road in the shoulder for hikers and walkers to use, uh, preferably with some separation from the roadway for safety. <clears throat> Those are sort of the two main options that you'll see for all of the trail facilities that are proposed along the side of the roads. Go class one pathway, or a separate natural surface trail, which is less expensive. <clears throat> Let's see here. The, and then N2 uh, can combine, uh, joins with the Omar Rains Trail, which is also a class one facility uh, that, that goes into the city of Ventura. So here's a picture of that existing class one pathway. And so if improvements can be done to link this middle segment in, the coastal trail on the north coast would essentially be completed. Here's another picture of the sea path, uh, the path on the seawall revetment. And skipping over the city of Ventura, over the city of Ventura to the central coast area, you see that the map got a lot busier. It looks like there's a lot more trails on this map. We show existing bike lanes and existing trails included in the maps to show the connectivity, but they're not officially included as part of the coastal trail. But we do want to, you know, provide those connections and make sure they match up with what's in the cities. And so this segment is uh, B is C. Yeah, C1. And that extends from the bridge in McGrath State Beach um, down to where the county boundary ends near the Reliant Energy Plant. So the idea here is that hikers and walkers will be able to cut through McGrath State Beach and go along the coastline, potentially all the way down to the Channel Islands Harbor along the beach. But then the cyclists would use Harbor Boulevard, where the beach, again, may not be passable during all times of the year. And therefore, a trail should also be provided uh, along Harbor Boulevard. And that's a county-owned road, uh, county-maintained road. To, to accommodate walkers that can't go on beaches. Sometimes it's hard to walk on a beach. The Silver Strand and, and Hollywood Beach communities are also included. Um, these provide connectivity to the harbor and are sort of more stopover points or return to point of origin segments of the coastal trail. The harbor is not included because that's not regulated by the coastal area plan. It's regulated by the public works plan and implemented by the Harbor Department. <clears throat> Here's some pictures of the Central Coast facilities, McGrath State Beach, Hollywood Beach, 
the bridge over the Santa Clara River has an existing facility there for pedestrians and cyclists. And Harbor Boulevard has some bike lanes in some areas, but needs bike lanes in other areas. I believe that's slated as, an, as a long-term project uh, for the Transportation Department to add bike lanes in that area. So skipping over Oxnard now into the other portion of the Central Coast that's by Ormond Beach and the Point Magoo Navy Base, um, <clears throat> we see that the, the, through nature, uh, the through nature and the through, uh, through objective of the Coastal Trail requires it to go along Wainimi Road and circumvent the military base because the public is not allowed to walk on the, on the beaches at the military base. And so you know, we asked them, and they said missiles are being launched, so that's probably not the best idea. And so we did include it in Ormond Beach, and so ideally hikers could walk along the beach from the harbors in Point Magoo, or sorry, and uh, Wainimi, Port Wainimi down here, and come up Wainimi Road and then link back up the main segment to go around the base. And Ormond Beach is going to be an effort, uh, a planning effort conducted and restored, you know, in conjunction with the Nature Conservancy, the City of Oxnard, and the Coastal Conservancy, who is, they're finalizing their transactions to purchase the land out there, and the Coastal Trail would be included. Um, <clears throat> the Ormond Beach and the McGrath efforts are a great opportunity to get the Coastal Trail going today and included in these updated planning efforts as they occur. So timing is of the essence here. Worth mentioning is this problematic area, the Las Postas Road interchange, and this is an area where um, basically, prior to this, this Navy frontage road includes a Class II bike lane. It's on naval base property. Uh, they were kind enough to authorize uh, coastal trail users and cyclists to use the publicly accessible portions of their property on this frontage road instead of sending users along that uh, freeway configuration of Pacific Coast Highway in that area, which is very dangerous. And so <clears throat> that area can be used for the coastal trail. But the bike lane is, is, is not included in this 0.6 mile segment from their main gate down to the Calagas Creek Bridge. The clover configuration of the interchange is a difficult planning issue, as you can see here. And so that's really the only segment of this proposal that needs really additional detailed planning to figure out how pedestrians can get through that area. On the other hand, we don't anticipate very many pedestrians trying to traverse that area. Generally, people will stop at Ormond Beach to hike around and then hike around the Santa Monica Mountains. But it's a three or four mile stretch between the two to go around the bays. So it would be primarily used by cyclists, the long distance cyclists at this point. And then the last part of the maps is the South Coast area. And this is an area that's obviously rich in natural resources, which are consistent with the state goals for the coastal trail. And <clears throat> the trail should be included in Pacific Coast Highway, which is shown here, <clears throat> along with some of the year-round beaches, such as Thornhill Broom Beach, Sycamore Canyon Beach, and the uh, Yerba Buena Beach is, is also passable. And then the National Park Service and the State Parks Department have been working on a coastal slope trail, which is a trail that is intended to traverse the frontage of the mountains uh, facing the ocean along the entire length of the National Park Service. It is anticipated this will be included in their uh, regional trail planning update and in their integrated trail, trail plan update that's underway. It's also included in the land use map in the coastal area plan for this area. So that's a long-standing policy. Right now, the coastal slope trail is shown here in the green and red, and it's relegated to the trails existing in Point Magoo State Beach and also a little bit in Leo Carrillo that, that is in the county, uh, that is within the county's jurisdiction. The green is for hiking, and then as we get towards this area, the backbone trail comes in, and that's the big new trail that allows hikers, equestrians, cyclists, and so equestrian cyclists are allowed on, on some of these areas, and this was a part of the errata, erratum that was sent out the other day to clarify that Equestrians are allowed on, on these segments of the trails according to the state park uh, trails planner that I, that I spoke with. <clears throat> the other areas are, are really steep. And so essentially this, this, this segment here would require nine miles of hiking compared to three miles or so on PCH. So therefore there should be like a flat, easier to traverse trail 
a long Pacific Coast Highway there uh, for hikers and, 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 road, and road bikers to use as well. <clears throat> there's some pictures of the great resources that are in the South Coast. So wrapping this up, the, the goals, policies, and programs that are proposed uh, focus on the continuity aspect and the connectivity, uh, the, the design of the trail, providing a safe um, and pleasant experience, and how to implement the trail, how to construct it, maintain it, and, and things like that. <clears throat> so going into the policies, the policies for alignment and access um, basically call for avoiding sensitive habitat, provide mul multiple means of transportation, um, do not, you know, specifically describe that the trail should be located on public land and public easements, not on private lands. <clears throat> and also consider our neighbors at Point Magoo Base. Then the design policies call out things like, I mean, this, this report from the state says the coastal trail should be designed within uh, within touch, sight, sound, scent of the ocean. We didn't go that far, but the idea was to locate as close to the ocean as possible, but also consider planning for things like sea level rise, um, user safety, reducing the environmental impacts, um, but also do things like make sure that the coastal trail improvements don't block views from other perspectives. And so that was in response to the, to the, to the guardrail concerns. And so a policy was included to, to address that. State law re requires respect of privacy, and so that's why it's not proposed on any private properties at this point. And, <clears throat> and also for the ESHA provisions, hike, it, they call that hikers would be allowed in the ESHA on designated trail areas, but uh, horses and mountain bikes can be a little bit more uh, damaging. And so for right now, the policies call for hikers in the ESHA, which is sand dunes on beaches, Ormond Beach and things like that. And then the implementation. Uh, so the, ordin the proposed amendments basically prioritize voluntary transactions with willing landowners to add the coastal trail in, um, include it in road projects as they occur, which would be discretionary projects, as well as park projects. <clears throat> and, uh, but then we also have to add the language in about if a sufficient nexus or proportionality exists in some instances uh, to protect the coastal trail, we would require um, an, an easement as part of a discretionary condition of a discretionary development project. So that's, that's relatively boilerplate trail, trail planning language. Um, right. Again, the maps can be updated. The trail can be added to without an update to the map, which can be a lengthy process to update the coastal area plan. And that's most of it. There are no specific metrics either in the design standards. We don't call for trail widths or anything like that. This is a good example of a natural surface trail that could be proposed along PCH, Wainimi Road, some of these other areas that have the least maintenance expenses. It's basically they grade it down, they put in the, the decomposed granite surface, and then separate it from the road. And it doesn't require the paving and the ongoing maintenance that some of the more expensive facilities require. <clears throat> the programs, there's three programs proposed. One is this master plan effort, which would include more detailed planning of, of routes, uh, look at providing more connectivity, to conduct more community outreach. So for instance, with the equestrian example, we would want to meet with horse groups and figure out you know, where they ride, uh, where they want to ride, where there's sufficient staging areas, what beaches would be good for them to go on, which would, would allow the, those facilities. But at this point in this process, we don't have the resources to really go through that effort and hear from all the recreationalists about what they would want and integrate that into a detailed plan. Uh, <clears throat> we hope to do that later, and the amendments today would actually position us to, to apply for grant funding to try to initiate that process. And we, there have been discussions with other state agencies about that. The discretionary, the other, the next program calls for inclusion in discretionary projects. And like I mentioned earlier, it's a, lot, a lot of it's focused on state park and road projects due to the way the trail is configured today in the maps. And the 
process will require much inter, a lot of interagency coordination, both within county agencies and with other cities and state agencies. Some of the implementation challenges are, are some that were brought up by you, Commissioner Onstott, as well. But before this, the improvements can be done for the trail that's, that's not already finished today, we need, we need the land, we need the design, engineering, and environmental analysis, maintenance agreements, and funding before a trail segment can officially be designated as part of the coastal trail. So all the areas that show improvements on the maps need to have you know, those four things checked off before they can officially be included. This will also include the cooperation of many agencies. For instance, the Ventura River Parkway Trail is actually maintained by the General Services Agency Parks Department. It was constructed by the Public Works uh, Transportation Department. And so we have you know, these different overlapping agencies that will combine with the Planning Department in the, in the conditions of discretionary review to provide the coastal trail. Um, but this project does not assign you know, the coastal trail to any of these agencies at this point. It does not specifically direct them to, de to, to design roadways with the coastal trail in it for the Transportation Department. We met with Caltrans and they, they were willing to, you know, design road improvements with the coastal trail that's part of their state directive. And that's already been done there on the north coast in cooperation with Caltrans. So there's a sort of a template for that. <clears throat> Concluding this. Ex it, excuse me. Yes. Before, before you go on to the next slide, sure. I just have to uh, warn people in two minutes, <laughs> we're going to have the uh, Great California Shakeout Drill. So um, we're going, you're going to hear noise over the, the speakers uh, simulating an, an earthquake. And uh, there'll uh, be a public uh, announcement over the public address system. And they're encouraging you to, um, you know, drill by dropping to the ground, taking cover under a sturdy object, and holding on. And that's in, in two minutes. While I have your attention, we also have a parking limitation. Uh, if you came um, early, there's three hour parking in lot G. So if you park there, you might want to, uh, I don't know, get out of the building and, and uh, move your car. I'm not sure. But anyway, um, I just wanted you to, to know what was going on before we actually have it in a minute. So carry on. <laughs> okay, thank you, Commissioner. Will that also include a break? And, 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 and maybe also we can use that time for a little break. So, okay. All right, well, let's see if I can just wrap up the coast, this part of it here within a minute or so. <laughs> um, or did you want to take a break right now? It's, keep going. Okay. Go ahead. <clears throat> So as I mentioned earlier, the recreation and access sections for the north, central, and south coast include minimal updates, remove some policies that have been completed since the last time this was updated about 20 years ago. And so uh, they, those actions would be, would be removed, those completed policies. Um, some of the references and facts were obviously outdated, some of the numbers, so we adjusted those. We did not add any new policies or change the intent of any existing policies. Uh, made sure it was consistent for the coastal trail. And, um, <clears throat> and so some of the policies which were completed, you know, the county deserves, the county and its partners deserve some credit for achieving some successful policies. Four out of six of these are, are done, <clears throat> including reserving access at La Conchita and Muscle Shoals. Um, the dunes at Mandalay Beach are still there. They've been preserved and are back under control of state parks. Um, Ormond, Ormond Beach restoration is, 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 is well underway, and um, some of the fees for this project in the Crown Point Estates near Malibu have been successfully transmitted to the State Parks Department to build low-cost visitor accommodation cabins in one of the parks in that area. So some of these programs have been completed. Good job. Uh, those are proposed to be removed <clears throat> in a rather unceremonious fashion. Um, and so some of the comment letters were re with regards to equestrian uses, add more, you know, they need to be better reflected. There was a policy that described adding additional facilities through time for equestrians, 
people with uh, disabilities, maybe mountain bikers. And so that was already included, but we also added in some clarification that there's a specific trail type for specialized users, which are equestrians and mountain bikers. And we added in those map edits that I showed you to clarify which sections of Point Magoo State Park allow horses. <clears throat> and, and, and so that's as far as we were able to take it at this point. We hope to do additional outreach and planning with the, with the equestrians as the plan progresses. And that shows the, the, the areas that allow the horses. They're designated as multimodal, and the table below it describes the, 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 the horses. Proceed. <clears throat> okay, we survived the earthquake drill. <clears throat> so there, there was a comment letter about this, as we spoke with about earlier, was this trail on the uh, seawall revetment at the Seacliff Beach Colony. <clears throat> um, the HOA for that community suggested that it would be should be the trailer segment should be removed um, because there are some technical issues with it it needs improvements in the areas that are identified uh, in the rock wall areas that are identified to have the trail on them the existing trail at the very end of it near Hobson Park meanders on to some uh, private parcels and so the existing trail doesn't match up with where the trail was planned on that facility and here's a map showing the trail. This is the Sea Cliff off ramp for a Highway 101 as a point of reference. Um, and the trail goes along this revetment. There's a Caltrans access easement there along the, the highway that allows vertical access to get to this pathway that, that goes along the top of the seawall. At low tides and during some seasons, there's sand at the toe of the revetment. And it's enough to pass as well. There's some stairways on it, and then there's the, the Hobson County Park here at the, at the uh, bottom right corner. And so at the very end here, the trail goes on to a couple of private parcels, uh, when actually, according to our reading of Coastal Commission uh, permit documents, it should go along this rock wall and eventually transition into Hobson County Park and provide the access. Today, it, it may be possible at low tides where individuals can walk around the obstacles here and use this stairwell that's here to get up onto the trail and pass through. The plan right at this point calls for improvements to provide that connectivity to Hobson Park at the top of the revetment. That would be done in a more detailed planning phase. <clears throat> So in response, you know, our, we read the Coastal Condition, Coastal Commission permitting documents a little bit differently than the Sea Cliff homeowners. Um, I think that both interpretations do not warrant removal of the facility from the map, but it may warrant including it as a title or seasonal route rather than a permanent fixture for the coastal trail. Um, and so what we'd like to do is maybe meet with the permitting staff, the Coastal Commission who, who, who declared, who, who worked on that project to really figure out whether or not uh, the vol voluminous you know, permit documents and reports produced as part of that effort to provide that seawall permit require that vertical access easement to connect through to Hobson Park or whether it is a seasonal um, access easement, in which case the designation would be adjusted in the plan. So that concludes the coastal trail. That was the only real comment that we received, comment letter that we received. And <clears throat> if there are any other questions, I'll move into the final section here, which is the housekeeping recommended actions. On that diagram you had, uh, a seat up here, yeah. you mentioned the staircase that, that comes off the beach onto the Yes. It's, Who maintains that? Uh-oh, that was the wrong button. 
That is maintained by the Sea Cliff HOA as the part of the conditions for the seawall permit. Is that the only uh, staircase? There's three of them, three of them on the site. There were many more, one for, you know, many for the different houses, but when the uh, permits were, were redone for the seawall, there was an improvement agreement in 2008, and, think, and they required some of those, I, as far as I know, that required some of those stairways to be removed, but the three that are there were improved and are, do allow public access, vertical access for the public to transition from the top of the wall to the toe of the wall when they're and the sand allows it, and the tides. Thank you. And excuse me, where, where does the access for that trail come from, from the north? Because I'm, it's not going to come along. Yeah, it's hard to see, but we hiked on it. We actually looked at it in a field visit, and it, it, it's right here along this pathway. You can see the parcel. There's this big Caltrans parcel here that is Basically, it goes out into the ocean, and so it's under these bushes and these trees. There's a little hiking pathway, um, you know, that's suitable for people to walk on to get out to the to the revetment. And there's a little sign that says coastal access. There's some constraints. There's not a lot of public parking in this area, but there is some further up by the fire station and things like that on the allowed on the road. This area would also be, is also proposed for the multimodal improvements as well, so that could be adjusted to, so the hikers could go this way is the idea. Although they have to go down the stairway during low tides is the interpretation of the Seacliff HOA folks. And our reading of the Coastal Commission's interpretation is that this path should go all the way through to the park. Did you have further questions, Commissioner Rodriguez? Yes. Okay. Um, does it end on the beach on the other side of that off ramp? The access? How do they how do they get over to that easement from the north? What? Yeah, it, it's and, today they can they can they can walk from existing parking areas. Um, they could park their bike. You know, there's the class two bike route, walk out along the pathway. They could go up from the south to the beach. Um, and then eventually, as the trail gets improved, which is the plan to improve the area, so the hikers that are coming through can diverge down that pathway as just part of their hiking route and, and, and use that access easement. Uh, so Would, there aren't a lot of parking facilities right adjacent to it, right. but the walkers can get in the area. You know, crossings may be needed, right, to cross PCH there, yeah. um, some other safety improvements. That would be part of the really detailed planning effort. And so this whole area calls for improvements on the, on the plan and on the map, and those improvements would, would entail that more detailed analysis okay. before it's, a fit, you know, considered as a designated part of the trail. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm concerned about that, obviously, and I'll also echo... Uh, 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 Chairman Dukas's comments about the issue of uh, uh, tides and, and the rising tides. Um, and uh, my recollection is, and I'm going way back, 20, 25 years ago, we had emergency repairs or uh, revetment put in there uh, because the, uh, of erosion and, and wave action. So it's been there a while. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and following up on that, if, if I may, are you done? Yes, I am. Um, following up on that, um, uh, I have uh, a recollection that that revetment is uh, is like a permitted structure that was put in. I mean, there were that. It is not um, a permanent landmass. That is something that was constructed to protect. Yeah, it's rocks to protect those properties as a result of wave action from. You know, uh, a number of things, including Caltrans cloverleaf there, but um, but that's not something that's that's permanent. 
So what is the timeline on this? I mean, even the revetment, I think, has a, a 30 year permit or something, 35 year permit, something like that. Um, the, the, it's my it's my recollection that uh, they they can uh, have those those rocks there for a certain period of time per the Coastal Commission. So, what is the timeline, you know, of of this trail? And and again, you know, with with rising ocean levels, um, are we? <laughs> What, what what are we really looking at? Those are those are a lot of big picture questions. <clears throat> so basically, the perception here is that, uh, according to our readings of the Coastal Commission staff report documents, which we still need to verify more, is that um, that 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 this that the beach was accessible by the public before the rocker vetment was built, before the Caltrans off ramp was built. Um, when Caltrans uh, authorized and uh, paid for that, the rocker vetment in the 80s, um, it was conditioned to replace the beach lateral access with lateral access for the public to walk and run on the top of the trail on the revetment there. Uh, it's sort of a prescriptive uh, access, if you will. I mean, it, it was there before, and it, it, this, this document state that the public was able to walk you know, from the top of the development down to the park in the past. And so I would assume that when that permit is renewed uh, for the seawall, which ostensibly it would be, um, then the, you know, the, the Coastal Commission will still condition the project to include the trail um, as it was done in 2008 yeah. when repairs were done to the seawall, it was still conditioned to include this public access easement. Uh, in terms of the grand picture of sea level rise and things, the sea level rise projections for this area and many other coastal communities don't look very, very good. And one of the assumptions there with including the call for improvements on old PCH there, that multimodal path, is that if worse comes to worse and this trail you know, does get inundated, there would be an alternative option along a you know, more critical arterial route that would be preserved in response to sea level rise um, by state agencies. That's also the assumption along the south coast as well, you know, P PCH and things like that uh, may continue to be armored in response to sea level rise. And, and, and so that's sort of the, the retreat approach to the coastal trail here. Multi, multi -modal or single mode routes in the hills are included in the south coast there and also um, along the main arterial routes we expect to be protected from sea level rise. Just, uh, yeah, it's not officially planned at this point. We have a grant pending. We're working on additional planning for sea level rise, and so this project would be included in that analysis as well. Commissioner Adukas, um, as Aaron mentioned earlier in his presentation, the Coastal Trail Plan is a network. It's a network. And in this particular area, that network would include a multimodal trail along PCH. Um, as part of Program 1, this future planning effort, we also are going to at least look at the use of Old Hobson Road as an alternate to PCH because it might offer a better opportunity, but we did not have the time or resources to do that, that at this time. So what the easement or the path that is part of the agreement for the Seacliff Colony, the public pathway, what, how that would function as part of this project is as a secondary route that would either only um, on a more permanent basis be open after the whole solution has been made regarding access to the county park or it would be labeled as a seasonal route that's only available either during certain seasons or even during certain tidal situations. It's really impossible for us to plan ahead for sea level rise and exa know exactly what's going to happen at this point in time. We recognize that that could have an effect not just on this segment but other segments of the coastal trail. Um, so our focus at this time is existing conditions. 
And um, this particular pathway would probably be a secondary route for someone who wanted to get off their bicycle and, you know, maybe walk their bike closer to the ocean at this point. Um, but even the existing conditions allow you to walk along the path without ever getting on private property, go down a stair and down to a beach under certain seasons and during certain times of the day. Thank you. Here's a question. Um, is there a provision, presumably there will be signage when you are that close to the ocean that there are um, inherent hazards of being at, at certain tidal situations, um, limiting the risk to, of liability for the county? Is that um, a consideration? There is a policy that allows signage to be to, to be included in the coastal trail to, to um, declare areas that are off limits and areas that um, uh, that are informational in nature, and so it seems conceivable that um, Seacliff, we you know we could work with the Seacliff landowners to include warning signs. But in, in a sense, it's it's really similar to other beach segments of the trail where they're all susceptible to storm surges and tidal fluctuations and things like that that the general public just has to be generally uh, considerate for, you know, cons con generally consider when hiking on beaches on the coast. Okay. So, and I'm sure we'll hear more about this one coming up. Uh, recommended actions. <clears throat> we had uh, four public outreach meetings as part of this project. Those occurred in August. We sent out f over 4,200 postcards to both landowners and residents. So that gets the people that are renting in the, in the areas that may use the coastal trail and need wireless service, as well as the landowners who um, may not live in the coastal zone. We included a website. We sent out email updates. And we did receive, I think, uh, 13 or 14 comment letters after the public outreach period. And those are shown in Exhibit 10 with responses. And we also did the mandated public notices in the newspaper. And I went around to libraries and dropped off the proposed amendments. <clears throat> the other exhibits include the Coastal Act findings, which... Right, so we had to conduct coal stock consistency analysis and a cumulative impact analysis, and those are in the exhibits, Exhibit 7 and Exhibit 8. And, and basically, um, in lieu of CEQA analysis, we must demonstrate that the proposed project will be consistent with the Coastal Act. Um, this was done not by ourselves, but also in conjunction with Coastal Commission staff to make sure that these proposed regulations include some of their edits and their policies. Um, that would provide consistency with the state law. Uh, these amendments overall are likely to result in cumulative impacts because um, <clears throat> they don't induce, in, induce growth in the population, they don't require a lot of water usage, produce a lot of waste, um, and they limit the amount of development. The trail is, is relatively thin overall, and wireless facilities have small footprints. So it's relatively easy to show that these amendments would be consistent with the Coastal Act and limit development and not be, not result in cumulative impacts. We also had to demonstrate general plan findings. <clears throat> and basically, um, <clears throat> you know, there's, there is recreational facility policies in the general plan. There's provision of utility services in the general plan, which are consistent with wireless facilities. And the proposed amendments would really just minimize the aesthetic impacts from those facilities and provide for the coastal trail. And so <clears throat> the idea, and also provide safety, the civil administrative penalties amendments would also provide safety for the community. So those are all relatively easy findings to f for the general plan. So today we are asking that the Planning Commission adopt a resolution um, recommending that the board find that the program is exempt from CEQA, that that consistency analysis was sufficient uh, adopt a resolution approving the amendments to the coastal area plan and also adopt an, an ordinance 
uh, approving the proposed zoning code amendments. And the more detailed staff recommendations are included in the back of your staff report. That concludes my 70 slide presentation. If you have any other questions, let me know. I do. Okay. <laughs> and congratulations. Thank you. That was um, really good. Uh, regarding Exhibit G from the City of Oxnard, did... Um, All right. Okay, so I didn't forget. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Dukas. Okay. Chair Dukas. Yeah, we received these late last night, and this is an email asking for minor uh, clarifications to the restoration efforts of the Ormond Beach area. And generally speaking, uh, you know, we can include these. Number two is not exactly clear what they mean, so I would need to follow up with them a little bit to figure out what statements they want to be removed. But, gen but generally speaking, these are all references to the coordinated effort to plan the Ormond Beach Recreation Area and clarify that it's not really open or doesn't include the coastal trail until a public recreation access plan is developed in conjunction amongst these agencies. So we can uh, include those comments in the amendments, and thank you for reminding me about that. Good, good. Any other questions of staff at this time? Okay, moving forward. Usually we have disclosures by commissioners, but we don't need that. Um, so I will open the public hearing and uh, we'll have uh, speakers. Let me call first Amanda F Fagan. And I'm calling you first because you're in neither support or... <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I wanted that to, to be clear. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, Madam Chair and members of the Planning Commission, uh, my name is Amanda Fagan and I'm the Community Planning Liaison Officer for Naval Base Ventura County. Uh, first and foremost, I want to say thank you to the County Planning Division staff uh, for their excellent early coordination with us regarding the alignment of the Coastal Trail. Um, we do concur with the proposed route as described uh, in, and also with the county's um, response to our comments submitted on August 31st. Um, I would like to highlight the need for continued coordination and, and our appreciation for the county's ongoing coordination with us uh, regarding the future planning efforts regarding the coastal trail and also implementation of that trail um, and the local coastal program more broadly uh, to ensure the protection of both military training, testing, and operational missions as well as protecting public health, safety, and welfare. Um, I would like to clarify you know, why it's important to us or why we're not able to provide access along the coastline, uh, along the beaches through Point Magoo. Um, there are a variety of um, training, testing, and operational missions that occur on the installation um, and concerns that would preclude public access uh, via the beach um, for a coastal trail uh, include um, the, the need for the public to, um, if, a, if a coastal trail were to pass along the coastline, uh, that would go through um, our public safe, or our explosive safety arcs. Uh, it may violate airfield security requirements and safety zones. Um, it may have uh, significant impacts to training, testing, and operational missions, including costly delays and cancellations. Um, and it may also have a significant impact on a variety of uh, special uh, spa status species that occupy our coastline. Um, so for those reasons, you know, we really appreciated the county's coordination with us and the way that the route is defined uh, along Wainimi Road um, and past Point Magoo. Um, and we also want to highlight um, the policy, I believe it's um, policy number 1.13, um, that provides for um, coordination with the Navy um, for any organized events that may pass um, along the um, frontage road. Um, there may be a need to issue a federal license to use federal property, um, which is a means of protecting the Navy and the Department of Defense and other federal interests, as well as ensuring public safety and security of the installation uh, for any major events like bike races that would use the frontage road. Um, so again, I want to say thank you to the county staff for their coordination with us, and thank you for your time this morning. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, I'll call the speakers who are in support first and then the speakers who oppose second. Sherry Burneth. And I apologize for messing okay. up your name. Uh, my name is Shari Bernath, and I am a resident of the coastal area, the southern coastal area. I have been working with Aaron on equestrian activities. I re represent a large group of people. And although they put in an addendum, which I am very for, the addendum doesn't go far enough. It doesn't include the Canyon View Trail, the, the complete Mishimoko Trail, which co pro connects Portrero Valley to the Coastal Trail, the Serrano Valley Trail and Wood Road, the La Jolla Valley Loop, Magoo Peak and Magoo Trail. And I'm currently working with a list of riders. Um, I just, while I was here, I told them who heard from Ruth Gerson, who is was the trail coordinator in um, Los Angeles County, who just opened the Ronald Reagan Ranch and had the trail connected to the Backbone Trail. There are many of us who do use these facilities regularly, and I feel it's very important to keep those trails open. There was not any language, which Aaron fixed by uh, addendum, that even spoke of equestrian use. It totally blocked us out. So I think that's an important thing to keep in mind, that this backbone trail and all these trails were originally horse trails. The Serrano Valley, all the way to Camarillo originally was how people got to the market, to the movies. It was used by, there was a lodge in Serrano Valley, which was used by Ronald Reagan and Walt Disney and others for passage. Once a year, they took their rite of passage, horseback ride through that area. So I have documentation of most of this. I have, um, Millie Decker has written to me about her use of the trail. She's now 101. And she wrote to me about her usage of the trails to go through Yerba Buena area, through and down Deer Creek, and across Serrano Valley and over those hills. I personally have ridden from the Danielson Ranch all the way through Serrano Valley. So I just want to make sure that is included and that we continue to work on that process. Any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Jackie Pinson. Thank you. I'm Jackie Pinson. I live at Silver Strand Beach in Oxnard, California. Um, thank you, Mr. Engstrom, for your presentation. After attending the Ventura County 2040 General Plan and the Ventura County Local Coastal Plan update meetings, I was disappointed that those meetings didn't allow for input about Channel Islands Harbor. I believe that when the county LCP was first presented to the Board of Supervisors, John Zaragoza told the Harbor Department to be sure that the harbor area was included, and the Board of Supervisors agreed. At the 2040 plan meeting at our own voting center, we were able to show how Oxnard and the county overlap everywhere, and we want to be sure our concerns, especially about county areas, are included in the county LCP. At both meetings, we were told to contact John Zaragoza and the Harbor Department. Someone from um, the planning department called me on behalf of John Zaragoza and essentially said the same thing to contact the Harbor Department. When I contacted them, they said there was no plan for meetings like those. And so I would like to know how we can give input for a vision and organized development plans for our harbor, like the other harbors up and down the California coast. We should be integrated with the coastal trail, which goes right by Fisherman's Wharf, which is not included. With marine, ocean, and tourist concerns there, we could also have the walking and bike trails down to our beaches and La Janelle which the coastal plan calls for, as well as coastal parking for public access. That would align us with the public trust doctrine, providing options harmoniously balancing maritime, recreational, commercial, retail, environmental, and entertainment interests. Thank you. Larry Manson.
Good morning, Commissioners. My name is Larry Manson. I live in uh, Midtown Ventura, and I'm representing Surfrider. Uh, we have a presentation, and I don't know quite how it gets loaded, uh, nor have I ever used one of these devices before. Be Great, thank you. And while we're waiting for that, may I uh, hand the Commissioners some hard copies of what you're going to see, just in case there's difficulty in viewing it? Larry, give them to the clerk. I'm sorry? Great, yeah. And I also have some for staff. Um, great. I think this probably does it. I wasn't quite sure how well this was going to show up on the screen. Thank you very much. So, uh, left arrow is forward. Great, thank you very much. Right arrows forward. Thank you very much. So essentially what I'm doing is addressing uh, the issue of access. This has to do with the California Coastal Trail, but also in a larger view, it really has to do with coastal access. And I'm looking at the area from Rincon Point to Emma Wood State Beach, uh, roughly about 10, about 10 miles. Uh, this hold, is an area hold, in hold, which... Uh, hold, hold on. I want you to rewind a little bit because I was distracted by this and Sorry. I missed what you started to say. Um, this is addressing the issue of access to the California Coastal Trail, but also in the larger view of things, it's really looking at coastal access from Rincon Point to Emma Wood State Beach, <coughs> and specifically I'm looking at parking. Is that great? So um, essentially what I've done is taken a look at, along with three other members of Surfrider at parking areas along this uh, section from Rincon to Emma Wood State Beach. and. When I first started uh, using this coastline in 1967, there was very, very, very little uh, parking regulation in that section. And in fact, this was before the uh, building of the new freeway. And to access, for example, Rincon Point, uh, you simply parked along the old, what is now uh, the re renovated Highway 101, but you could simply park along this on the shoulder of the route of the uh, road and gain access to Rincon Point. So uh, this. And again, this is, I apologize for this. Kind of this demonstrates the complexity of what I'm trying to put forward. Uh, what we've done, thanks to Cynthia Hartley, a, a Surfrider member, is to create uh, different colored sections showing different parking areas and the amount of uh, uh, time that people are allowed to park. So you can see that there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different zones and, and different time periods in which people can park or cannot park. Uh, along this 10 mile stretch of coast. So you can park in some areas beginning at 5 o'clock in the morning, 6 o'clock in the morning, or 7 o'clock in the morning. And you can park until, in some cases, in some different locations, until sunset, or 9 o'clock at night, or 10 o'clock at night. And the parking times are a mix of those. So that it's not simply, for example, 6 to 10, it could be 6 to 9, it could be 7 to sunset, uh, depending on the area that you're looking at. Um, and I'll uh, let me take a look at this. There we go. So starting at Rincon Point and going south, uh, this is the parking lot at Rincon, and parking is allowed here from 9 o'clock in the morning. I'm sorry, from... Uh, I'm used to dealing with the podium that's a little bit higher. From 6 o'clock in the morning to 9 o'clock at night. Sunrise on the summer solstice is roughly 5.45 in the morning. So a beach user could arrive here at literally during, during, during daylight and could be ticketed for parking in the Rincon parking lot before 6 o'clock in the morning. Um, what's interesting is, by the way, although it's not on this slide, on the left-hand side, there is an area of parking on the bluff, which is in Santa Barbara County, so we did not include this, and that allows parking from sunset, or from sunrise in the morning, rather. So if we go along and take a look at the next area, La Conchita, um, the green area there represents the parking space. Uh, there are approximately uh, 47 parking spaces, I estimate, and there are no parking restrictions. So at Rincon Point, at, six, at uh, quarter to 6 in the morning, you can be ticketed. Along here, you can be parking 24 hours a day and not receive any ticketing at all. There's also a beach access point, which allows uh, uh, access to the beach uh, via undercrossing uh, under the railroad tracks and Highway uh, 101. Going on to... Muscle Shoals, there's a very limited amount of parking. Again, as with La Conchita, there are no restrictions in that area. Uh, however, parking is extremely limited, and uh, when uh, surfing conditions are good, for example, it can be really pretty chaotic parking. As we take a look at uh, oil piers, there are really three distinct areas of parking in oil piers. Uh, the first is uh, the section on the coast, and that is, uh, let me consult my notes, 
Uh, that allows 5 o'clock in the morning until 10 o'clock at night parking. So that's really interesting to note that at 5 o'clock in the morning you can park legally at oil piers, whereas, for example, at Rincon Point you cannot park legally until 6, and at Muscle Shoals and La Conchita you can park 24 hours a day. The second area of parking in the oil piers area is the access road from the underpass underneath Highway 101, which allows you to get to the coast. It's about three-quarters of a mile down to the new parking lot, uh, which is the third parking area. Uh, that new parking lot was created by Caltrans. It has 202 parking spaces, and all three of those areas allow parking from 5 o'clock in the morning until 10 o'clock at night. Uh, then if you take a look at uh, Hobson, uh, Hobson, State, pardon me, Hobson County Park, um, that is an area which allows parking from 7 o'clock in the morning until sunset. Now, the difficulty with that, of course, is that sunset arrives at a different time every day of the year. And so anybody who's being ticketed, the officer uh, uh, issuing that ticket, would have to know technically what time sunset actually occurred. Then when you take a look at the top of Pitas Point at uh, Free Estate Beach, um, you also find the same situation that is parking in the morning from 7 o'clock until sunset. Those two are actually consistent. The county parks uh, folks apparently were able to sort that out. And then as you continue down uh, towards Mondo's, um, this is Pitas Point, uh, but Mondo's is the cove down inside. This is actually the longest point in Southern California. It's about a mile long. And parking is allowed on the north side of the, of the stretch of road from 7 o'clock in the morning until, excuse me, from 7 o'clock in the morning until 10 o'clock at night. There's no parking on the right-hand side of the road, which is adjacent to the housing. As you continue on down to Solomar, and this is a stretch of road between Mondo's to, um, uh, to Solomar Beach, and parking is allowed from 7 o'clock in the morning to 9, to 9 o'clock at night. I know you're being overwhelmed by this, and you see the complexity of it because almost every single space of specific parking zone is a different time from parking zones on either side of it. So I apologize for this being a bit overwhelming. It's taken me a long time to try to figure it out, and uh, I'm not quite certain that I still completely understand it. But I'm getting close to the end, so if you'll bear with me for just a bit. Uh, then there's a long stretch of coach, uh, coast from Solomar Beach. Uh, it's north of Emma Wood. Uh, parking is allowed there from 6 o'clock in the morning until 9 o'clock at night. And finally, and mercifully, we get to uh, the overhead, uh, which is the par parking on the bluff above uh, the state beach at Emma Wood State Beach. And that parking is allowed from 7 o'clock in the morning to 9 o'clock at night. Clearly, there's real, really no system of parking. It's a pretty chaotic situation. And Surfrider would like to rec make a recommendation that you consider the possibility of making uh, a, a uniform parking system with parking beginning at 5 o'clock in the morning uh, and going until 10 o'clock at night. There is a precedent for this in three different areas at oil piers, at the oil piers access road to the inland oil piers parking lot and at the oil piers parking lot, which, by the way, is the most recently posted of all of these areas. Uh, there's a couple of reasons for it. First of all, consistency is a good thing for the public. If along the stretch of coastline it's the same parking times, it makes it very understandable for the public. Uh, the second thing is it makes enforcement a lot easier. Uh, if you're an enforcing officer, you don't have to know what time sunset is, for example. Um, you don't have to know which particular parking zone you're actually enforcing. And in fact, there's a stretch of coastline between Solomar and Emma Wood State Beach where literally there's a signpost, and on the left-hand side, if you park at a quarter to seven in the morning, there's no fine. If you park to the right of that, literally a foot or two away, the fine is $275 or $295 for parking at a quarter till seven in the morning, whereas three feet away is completely legal. And if you park across on the north side where parking is illegal, the fine is $95. So the whole, the whole issue of consistency, I think, is one which is really important to the public. Um, I th the third reason for this is it takes into account actual rising and setting of the sun. It takes into account that people do arrive at the beach very early. And the first time that I actually saw Rincon and people surfing, I arrived very early in the morning in the spring of 1964 before sunrise. And I was ready to go out and I realized that there are already three people in the water. So much for crowding these days, it's not, 
it's not any different than it used to be. Uh, so finally, um, changing the time from uh, the whole mishmash of uh, varying time periods uh, really does allow the control of illegal camping at night because obviously people don't pull up at uh, 4 o'clock in the morning to be camping at night. If uh, parking is available after 5 o'clock in the morning, you're really allowing access to the beach for people who really do use it. So thank you for your forbearance and listening to all of this information. I'd be very happy to answer any questions that you might have. Do you have any questions? Well, I have a question as to why we have variances in time uh, restrictions. Um, just from a housekeeping standpoint, it seems to me enforcement would be extremely difficult, is extremely difficult. I don't know whether it's, it's it factors in requests from residences in the various residents in the various communities. I suspect it may. Um, and beyond that, it falls to who the enforcement arm is or arms are, whether it's county parks or, or whether it's highway patrol or just who it is. But I think some consistency in time uh, regarding enforcement would be beneficial to everybody. Um, Enforcement, I as I understand, is by park rangers. Okay. Uh, I, I can see, you know, having come from a background that had to deal with enforcement issues, consistency is, is, is much easier on anybody that goes out there to try to take care of a problem. Um, consistency is certainly a virtue. Um, I, I can't answer the question as to how these times were imposed. Um, I think really it's just one of those evolving things that I think as projects were done, for example, the most recent parking lot at Inland Oil Piers, uh, I think what probably was done was simply adjacent parking was from 5 o'clock in the morning till 10 o'clock at night, and so that was adopted. Uh, I don't, I, I think the issue is that there was not a plan. The issue of, of residents is certainly of concern because you know, it's important for people to have their privacy and to not be exposed to rowdy partiers and that sort of thing. Uh, but most of these parking areas really are not that terribly close to, to uh, housing areas. For example, there's no parking along Solomar Beach or along Cliff, uh, along Sea Cliff, near the housing. Um, there is parking on the beginning and the end of that housing, uh, but not throughout that stretch of Highway 1 of, of PCH, which is actually adjacent to the housing. So hopefully there's, I, I really honestly don't see, I mean, you can already park sometimes at 6 or 7 o'clock in the morning. Um, I doubt that people would be making a lot of noise at, for example, 5 o'clock in the morning because if they're going to be there, they're going to be walking their dog or going fishing or going surfing, that kind of thing. It's not going to be the leftover remnants of rowdy revelers from the night before. Um, I do notice that a couple of these um, parking areas are in county campgrounds True. and so it makes sense to have the parking regulated a little more stringently because everybody's camping and they don't right. want people just Absolutely. spending the night so that might need to be exempted from the across the board but that, I understand where you're coming from that's a very <laughs> good point does the county have jurisdiction over this issue yeah. somebody anybody uh, Commissioner Onstad, I would say that we have limited jurisdiction depending on where it is, right? So I think the best that we could do was uh, was understand the issue and coordinate and have a you know have a program to coordinate with the agencies to see if there is. But I think that there's probably a host of other issues that you'll get to waking up campers, maybe being too close to adjacent residential. So I think it's worth the conversation and and worth that coordination between everybody that that has um, parking uh, along this coastal trail but I'm not sure, you know, we're going to be able to move the mark a lot, but, but you know, we could have a, a more um, comprehensive discussions with the Surf Rider Foundation and, and all sorts of other people, so we could gather them and, and talk about it. Anyway, it's not an action item for today, is it? Well. Or is it? I uh, Commissioner Onstad, the, the, the primary way it might be an a action item for today is that we do have a future program that's outlined in the coastal area plan for proposed adoption and it's a pretty detailed master planning effort. Um, I just took a look at that program and noticed that it really doesn't mention coastal access parking. 
So one of the items that we could do is to specifically add in coastal access parking as something that would be looked at in the future as part of that master planning program. It sounds appropriate to me. I agree. Could I clarify one thing? Uh, there was an issue raised about access to the coastal trail, um, and I'm sorry I don't have a slide that actually covers it, uh, but there's a, a coastal access point, uh, maybe I do have it, um, which allows access to the, the um, breakwater in front of Sea Cliff. And the irony of that whole thing is that in terms could you, of parking. Could you hold on a minute? Sure. Could we get the planning staff to go back to your, um, oh, is this sufficient for you to make your point? Uh, yeah, I, I, I believe it is. Um, if I can just, I'm not quite sure what, no, unfortunately it doesn't show up. But there is a, a the Cloverleaf, Cloverleaf off-ramp at Sea Cliff. Uh, right beside that, there's a coastal access point and it goes to a place which surfers call Pete's Reef. And just the irony of the whole parking situation, there's no public parking for three or 400 yards. <laughs> so that's, there's a larger issue actually beyond just times that I think we need to take a look at in terms of where there's actually accessible uh, access points which can be utilized by members of the public. So Pete's Reef is um, by the clover leaf? Yes. It's just to but the But there's no parking? Of, correct. So well, where do people? The, you can park by the uh, uh, on the other side to the west on the other side of the fire station. Okay. Or you can park all the way at the other end of Sea Cliff, which is, I don't know the distance, but it's a significant distance. Yeah, that's a long way. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you, and I'd like to thank staff for being very, very helpful in helping me to understand this. Next speaker would be Sandra McLaughlin. Good morning, commissioners. Thank you for having me here this morning. My name is Sandra McLaughlin, and I also want to um, express my appreciation for the presentation that was done this morning. I have um, a couple very brief statements in regard to the coastal trail. Um, I'm a resident of the beach area in Oxnard, and I would recommend that a couple of additions be made to the coastal trail. One is extending C1E to the um, end of Silver Strand Beach where the Large Anel Park is there and there is a parking lot there and a paved street. There are also bike trails on Ocean Drive which is the route to go there from the north end of Silver Strand Beach. There is also a extensive parking space both at the North Jetty and the South Jetty. In addition um, I also had a question regarding in Port Wyneme that um, the coastal trail goes down and down Wyneme Road and does not go down to the beach at to Wyneme Beach, which they have a historical lighthouse there, and they also have a pier at Wyneme and it's it's really a lovely area also and I noticed that was omitted on the coastal trail and that is pretty much my input that I wanted to give and thank you for allowing me this time thank you any question can I just follow up with that are these areas that um, that the county has purview or is this uh, city of Oxnard and Port Wyneme um, Thank you very much. Silver Strand is within this is with is, is an unincorporated area within the county. It's an unincorporated island that's basically bordered by the Port Wyneme Naval Base. <clears throat> the pier area in the city of Port Wyneme um, is not included in the county's jurisdiction, and it, therefore it's not included in the extent of the maps that we made. It just wouldn't fit into the overall design of the maps. But I would have been in discussions with city representatives and it makes complete sense to incorporate the coastal trail 
into that stopover point of Port Wainimi and that pier area because if a user is going south, that's going to be the last area for amenities such as bathrooms, restaurants, um, things like that to, to, to stop over by before going down into Malibu many miles. So that would definitely be an important aspect of the Coastal Trail, and I think interagency coordination part of the programs would include that. So, so do you have that information already? Does county staff already have that mm. on your radar? <clears throat> Yeah, we can confirm that the Coastal Trail in includes the complete aspect of Silver Strand Beach from both jetties. At a glance, it looks like it does, but we can verify that. And then the part in the city of Port Wainimi, though, um, it, they don't, it doesn't show, it, it's, it's, it's too large of an extent to show on the detailed maps, basically, at this point. But you know, rest assured that it would be included in the in the coastal trail and in the coordination efforts. Thank you. Madam Chair. Yes. Um, yeah, there are parking lots at both ends of Silver Strand Beach. Um, the one at the south end um, can be iffy at times because of maintenance problems there. Um, and that being said, the county past maintenance of Silver Strand over to Harbor District, or Channel Islands Harbor, um, which goes to the comment the previous speaker made about not being able to have input into that harbor operation or development, et cetera. But the, the Harbor Department, Channel Islands Harbor is responsible for the maintenance of the beach. And as they found out recently, also responsible for that parking lot at La Janelle. Um, so you need to, whatever happens, you need to coordinate and make sure that uh, that uh, Director Krieger is on board there. Okay. Thank you. We, we we received comments from her, but we will definitely touch base with her regarding that. Okay. Is that it. Thank you. Uh, is Jennifer Sage still here? Oh, you moved. <laughs> Welcome back. I don't know if I could still be here, but um, pardon me for uh, having my PowerPoint on item number four. Um, part of it was for that and this, and I would like to forward that PowerPoint. If you could load that once again. I just want to pick out two photographs in that, um, which ha does have to deal with the coastal trail which Erin has worked really hard for, and I am a bike rider and a hiker, and I am supportive of it, but I do believe by the photographs that I have that we do have to bear in mind certain restrictions that we have pertaining to our scenic view. I um, just to remind that I believe this uh, Ventura County Planning Commission and staff does have jurisdiction over our scenic view sheds. And, um, and as number two, any kind, of, any kind of maintenance or repairs of Caltrans guardrails need to be reviewed and permitted because they are not replacing like for like of original guardrails. They are higher um, when, they, when they repair and, and have maintenance done on them. Um, Uh, just going just to this one, um, this, just at the very beginning, um, showing our past ocean views on the right of what we used to have before the bike path was put into place. And this is present. We need to really analyze this picture here because what I see about the coastal plan uh, is that there is going, it will be put along many, many parts of our Pacific Coast Highway and 101. And we really need to think about where and what side of the road that bike path is going. Because if it's going on the ocean side, this is the requirements of Caltran. Uh, uh, if it's uh, if it, there's a slope, uh, a cliff on the side, we need a double railing system for a bike path. And 
to, to one, to keep people from falling off, off a cliff, and the other standard to be put between the barrier of the bicycles and the motorists. And right now, the, the Caltrans laws state 42, 48 inches high. And so every place that along our Pacific coast and everywhere that this plan is being proposed, this is what we're going to see if we put the, the bike trail along the coast. And I don't know if any of you travel this, but there's no, there's no view anymore. Um, we have to do what's for the good of all, not just uh, specific interest groups. And we really need to bear in mind what the requirements and standards are for Caltrans when it comes to motorists being close to a, 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 a drop and plan that ahead so that, you know, there's ways to get around this, um, but we really need to put our thinking caps on and figure this out. I'd love to see the spike uh, trail go, but uh, even going over the, uh, the Ventura River um, uh, Harbor, you know, we have a beautiful view right now. Those are old photographs of, of the existing bike trail. But when we put in a bike trail, I mean, I love to see the Ventura River and, and how it swaths down into the, the, the ocean and, and, and the whole corridor of view of there. But that will be obliterated. And so uh, I really urge you that this is a very sensitive area. Our views should be foremost because they're for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Now I'll take speakers who are opposed to the recommended action. First, Steve Harbison. If you could just pass it along. Did you read it? My leg went to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe my brain. Here. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, and thank you for your attention to these matters. Uh, my name is Steve Harbison. I'm a homeowner at Seacliff Beach Colony and have lived there uh, for about 22 years. Um, I would like to ask you to uh, withdraw the sea cliff portion of this proposed plan. Uh, it's not well thought out. It, they hope that it will be a through path. They, they hope that all of their paths or trails will be through trails and not dead end trails. This one essentially would be a dead-end trail for people walking in from the north. Um, the, the northern access to the path that exists at Seacliff now is on Caltrans land, and I don't really know if there is an easement in favor of the public over that Caltrans land. I do know that uh, people walk in, principally surfers, and they come in, and as far as we're concerned, they're, they're welcome. They come, they don't really walk along our path usually, although sometimes they will walk down to a stairway and go use the beach. I don't know where they're parking. There's no uh, close parking. But on the north end, that little access looks more like a, a goat trail. It's, it's just been created by people walking over it. It hasn't been engineered or graded or prepared to really be a footpath, a very comfortable one anyway for many people. More importantly, on the south end of <clears throat> our property at the Hobson Beach end, um, we have determined that um, a portion of the path is actually on private property and not on the property which is governed by the uh, deed restriction that was created some years ago. Let me back up a little bit to give you uh, some time frames. Um, staff is relying upon a, a recorded deed restriction that was created in 1983. Uh, it was created at the time that the former owners of the property at Seacliff wanted to subdivide the southern portion of the land from one lot into 10 separate lots. 
They ultimately got uh, approval to do that, and part of that approval process had to go through the Coastal Commission. As a condition of the Coastal Commission approving the subdivision, um, the, the Coastal Commission required that the owners enter into a, a deed restriction. And it's very limited. Um, by the way, it's, it's not a public access easement. The proposed plan uh, constantly refers to it as one of the several public access easements. For there to be a public access easement, there has to be an offer of dedication. There has to be an acceptance of that offer of dedication by some public entity or a, an appropriate nonprofit entity. Um, and the accepting entity needs to be responsible for um, maintenance and uh, control of that easement. Um, this is not a public easement. This is a deed restriction. And with respect to the path we're talking about, it provides that um, the owner acknowledges the right of the public to lateral access, paren, limited exclusively to the right of the public to walk and run, close paren, on parcel B, uh, on the inland side of the revetment on the existing path. So in 1983, would it be helpful to get the slide and you point uh, what that parcel is, what what section of, because there's like 50 homes there, aren't there? Yeah. It, okay. It's, so it's easy to explain, really. Uh, I'd like to see it. it okay. It, it'd be helpful to me. Can somebody bring it up? Staff presentation again. Please. Please. That picture is worth a thousand while they're, words. While they're doing that, I'd like to uh, thank staff, by the way, um, who met with our uh, land use and coastal uh, attorney who came down from San Francisco yesterday to meet with staff, and our coastal engineer surveyor who came up from Long Beach to meet with staff and, and demonstrate what I'm going to tell you about. But they were very gracious to meet with us on short notice this all comes together together very quickly. <laughs> we got the staff comments to our earlier objections about 10 days ago. I'm not sure what the yellow lines uh, purport to show on this particular uh, photograph, <clears throat> but um, let's see if I can manipulate this thing. If I push the little button. The little uh, light button there, the little red. Uh, don't do that one. Oh. This one is the pointer. Oh, okay. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Well, of course, you can see where the revetment is. Let me digress a little bit even, even more. I'm sorry, I'm very nervous. This is extremely important to our homeowners, and I feel a great responsibility to try to convince you to pull this out of, out of the plan. I mean, our neighbors are uh, really afraid of this. Um, the revetment was built by Caltrans, and it was built by Caltrans uh, partially in settlement of an eminent uh, inverse condemnation lawsuit filed against Caltrans because when they built the uh, interchange at Seacliff on fill out into the ocean, it changed the natural ocean processes such that it removed the beach. So we've been fighting with governments for a long time, <laughs> including that one. Uh, but Caltrans built the revetment uh, at their expense. And it gave uh, the, the homeowners, if you will, the responsibility to maintain, and we th think the right to maintain, the revetment. Uh, in 1972, a record of survey was recorded with respect to Seacliff 
property, apparently uh, primarily to create separate taxable parcels, because all of these parcels were leased out to individuals. And when that record of survey was recorded, it described among some common areas for the colony um, along what I call the backside, uh, which is a, a, a private road that we get to our houses from. And another piece of the common area is, was this, was, well, let me say, no, that, that wasn't there then. But they created a parcel B along the front, which was supposed to be where the uh, revetment was built and where what we're now calling a path is. In fact, that path was never built or engineered or created as a path. It just was the land that existed between the, the rock revetment and the, and the private property lines. So the private property lines apparently are shown along here too. Then in 1983, when they did the subdivision of the southern 10 lots, uh, they added on to parcel B. You have a question? <laughs> I'm just <laughs> counting which ones you're talking about, where it goes to. Uh, it's not really important for this purpose, but it was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, approximately to there. And that may be what that, that line shows. So that was an addition to parcel B. And parcel B then is all that land between uh, what became um, private ownership and the, the seaward toe of the revetment. That's parcel B. Um, so the deed restriction that was required by Coastal Commission talks about the existing path on parcel B. Well, we have discovered that not all of the path is on parcel B. In fact, I think you've each been handed a, 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 a one-page photo today that has um, uh, lines um, drawn on it from surveys that show that the path, yeah, quote unquote, actually goes wholly on some of these last lots. Three Hold or, it. Partially and wholly on three or four of them. I don't, I, I'm sorry to keep interrupting you, but I don't have that photo. I thought it was going to make your board package. It's, it's in attachment A at the end of the letter from the attorney. Oh, uh, it's an attachment to our attorney's letter that was provided to staff. It's just a one-page oh, oh, okay. photo. So in any event, it, uh, what this demonstrates is that the path does not uh, extend in, in, in a continuous way to the fence that is between Seacliff and Hobson Park. The fence is on our common area land, and it extends all the way to the street and uh, into the ocean. And it prevents people from walking from the park or into the park from the path or from our property. Um, initially, staff was proposing that something be done to try to eliminate the barrier, quote unquote, between the Seacliff Path and Hobson Park. Uh, we are certainly not going to agree to eliminate that fence and open our private gated community to the public park in that way. Um, that would entirely change the use. It would be a terrible security problem for us to do that. Um, so we don't think that's ever going to happen. So consequently now staff is talking about, well, the other through route is down the stairways from the path to the beach, then walking south along the beach uh, to Hobson Park where there are public steps. But they have no plan for how any of the coastal trail is going to go through Hobson Park even. I mean, they, 
that's not part of anything that's described in this plan so far. So the, the plan is really half-baked and it won't work. And it's not necessary. Uh, Seacliff Beach Colony is about four-tenths of a mile wide or long, if you will, along the highway. Uh, there are many places along this 10 or more miles of uh, Pacific Coast Highway where there is beach access, where there are beach views, where there are island views. There's nothing special about the views or the access at Seacliff. Um, it, it, it's not needed for any of those purposes. It's not needed for a hiking trail because the, the multimodal trail will go along PCH. Behind our properties there on PCH, there's already a striped bike lane and from the inside of that striped bike, bike lane to the edge of the pavement is 20 feet wide. There's plenty of room to build hiking trails added on to the existing bike trail, to put fences if they need to to protect. So there's lots of room, and people use it all the time. People are walking along that property the whole length of uh, the Seacliff Colony. Um, you know, one of our obvious concerns is uh, privacy and, and uh, private property rights. This so-called path uh, is so close to the properties that you, you could reach over and shake buddy, somebody's hand who's sitting in their own front yard or on their own pen, porch. It's right there. It's just so present. And adding this to the coastal trail presumably would uh, mean a, a huge increase in the number of people walking uh, in front of our homes for no particular purpose, uh, no great advantage to them to do that. Um, legally speaking, um, our attorneys believe that would constitute an illegal overburden of the public rights. When, when the rights were created, in 1983, there was no, no conception of a California coastal trail, no conception of inviting no. Uh, the world through published maps or through signage or anything like that, that they could come in and walk in front of our homes. Uh, importantly, the statute which created the coastal trail uh, in 2001-2002, Senate Bill 908, and it, it's a very short statute <laughs> for statutes. It, uh, it says, the California Coastal Trail shall be developed in a manner that demonstrates respect for property rights and the proximity of the trail to residential uses and that evidences consideration for the protection of the privacy of adjacent property owners. Um, there's a general statement in, in the proposed plan about respecting privacy rights or, or private property, but there's, there's no consideration of that with respect to our little proposed segment of the California Coastal Trail. Um, staff talks about the need for connectivity. You know, the connectivity for the coastal trail is PCH. I mean, it makes sense. And an even better kind of connectivity for a real hiking and biking trail would be through up through what we call the flower fields. They call it Hobson Road. It's on a slight buff, uh, bluff um, above Seacliff Beach Colony. It has uh, really nice views over our houses uh, to see the coast and, the, and its dirt, and it has no intersections, and it has no parking. It would be an ideal place for a trail, and I think that really should be studied. They'd have to, the county would have to acquire some rights to use it, and I, I don't know if there's been any approach to do that. Um, Take a look back at my notes, because I 
It is a private gated community. Um, there's a, um, a gate that requires an access code to get into the colony from the highway. Um, this would destroy uh, the nature of our neighborhood to invite the public to wipe, uh, hike or walk along that trail. And it's really not a trail. Oh, by the way, I should say that access, um, through access on the beach is very problematic. Uh, as sea levels rise, we find that there are very few days in which there is beach to walk on down below us, below our revetment. Uh, it has to be a, a negative tide without storm surge surf and with lots of sand in place. The sand gets gouged out from time to time. It changes for three or four feet of sand along the front of our sea cliff property. So most days you can't even, you couldn't even walk from the bottom of our stairs to the Hobson Beach stairs to get up into Hobson Park. It's not really a very good thoroughfare. Further, our path itself is often inundated from high seas and storm surf. What we're referring to as a path is sometimes during the year a moat. It fills with water. I mean, literally, m much of it. And large rocks, small rocks get uh, strewn over the path from, uh, from that surf. It's unbelievable. Boulders is, you know, this big get knocked off the wall onto the path. Uh, so it's even the path itself is not always walkable. Um, so I would urge that you please take this piece out of out of the plan. Uh, staff has recognized that there are, it needs more investigation, and I think they're right, and I think it shouldn't be included now. I'd be happy to ask answer any questions if you have some. Go ahead, sir. Who owns Parcel B? It, the Homeowners Association, it's common area for the Homeowners Association. It's a planned unit development right. and legal effect. So there are, there are common areas, the, the street on the, on the back side, the end lot that is empty, and parcel B. If, for instance, the formal trail was dropped from this segment, how would that clear title to whatever easement that was granted? It wouldn't. Uh, the public would still have the rights that the public has right now right. to walk up our stairs from the beach and walk along our path. I, we, we are not proposing to eliminate those rights. We're sorry they were ever created. Uh, it was probably an illegal imposition by the Coastal Commission when they made them do it, uh, but that was before some some better Supreme Court law about those kind of conditions. Uh, it was done by our former owners, who, by the way, donated Hobson Park to the county. <laughs> uh, but we, we are stuck with the deed restriction. It is there. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. And our last speaker is Richard McCogney. And I'm sorry for butchering your name. Yeah, Rick McCogney, Santa Monica Mountains area of Ventura County. And uh, I have two issues that um, I'd like you to review on the proposal one deals with an issue I brought before this board four months ago, or March. Um, it's the Coastal Act's requirement that the public be involved in the planning process. And the Coastal Act says very clearly that without uh, public's involvement, that the chances of achieving what the state of California wants for the coast is very unlikely to happen. And um, 
Two and a half years ago, I approached planning and basically asked for a seat at the table. And um, I think that the response from planning as given at this meeting several months ago is that planning didn't have the time or money to involve themselves with the give and take with the public regarding the development of the coastal plan. That seems to be completely at odds with the legislation, at least the spirit of the legislation. I believe that the coastal plan, of which you're dealing with a part of it here, would be so much different and so much better if there was a process for public involvement. It seems like the planning process includes several steps, many of which the public has not been a part of. First of all, the original Coastal Act in Ventura County's local coastal plan, I think, was enacted in 1982. So we've had 40 years almost of experience, 30-some, uh, with the existing coastal plan. A good review of the coastal plan requires that you first review what you have done in the past, analyze it, to see if it achieved what you wanted it to achieve, and uh, make suggestions for changes. Clearly, these things are not perfect up front. I don't think the public was involved in any review of the existing coastal plan. And then after you ex review the existing plan, you kind of establish the parameters and scope of what you expect to do with the coastal plan. What, is our, what are we going to do? The public, again, was not involved in any part of those decisions, as far as I'm aware of. Then we have the process of the development of the coastal plan. Again, the public was not involved at any stage in the development of the coastal plan. And then there becomes the review. The review in which we are notified and allowed to comment. And that's where the public was finally brought in through outreach, outreach meetings and hearings like this. So I think that if you look at the complete planning process, the, the process uh, of the Ventura County in, this, in, uh, in the coastal plan update does not meet either the intent or the requirements of the Coastal Act. Um, who was involved in this? It was the county planning office and coastal planning office. And they, I mean, uh, I think another comment was Ventura County Planning had 60 meetings with coastal on this process. And if we're satisfied with two bureaucracies sitting around a table without a seat available for stakeholders and people who are interested and affected by coastal is a good process, then the process that's been pursued here is very good. I disagree. Um, the second issue was the coastal trail. In my reading of the, uh, at an outreach of the details of this, it says that the coastal trail cannot come any closer than 10 feet to a private residence. I don't know if any of us want to live in that residence. Second of all, it says that a condition of granting a permit for the building of a house would be conditioned on the granting of an easement for the coastal trail. The Supreme Court has looked at this issue in another case called Nolan versus the California Coastal Commission, which was a Ventura County case, in which a guy wanted to change his house from a bungalow to a larger house. And that permit was conditioned on him giving an easement. Uh, in order to get his permit in Ventura County. This went all the way to the Supreme Court. 
and the Supreme Court said that that was unconstitutional. It said that the building restriction is not a valid regulation of land use, but an out and out plan of extortion. I don't understand what the county is proposing in its local coastal plan requirement, how that is different than the case already decided by the Supreme Court and perhaps county council understands that. So, thank you. I'm just trying to remember what year that was. 91. Okay. Okay. Uh, I believe that is all of our public speakers. So uh, now we'd have uh, closing comments by staff. Thank you, uh, Chair Dukas. I have a couple to start with, and then I'm going to uh, I'm going to turn it over to staff for them for the more specific. I would just say to to Richard on the public outreach, and I've met with him a few times. Uh, we have a 89-page document, Exhibit 10 public re outreach uh, summary and responses to public comments. So, you know, there was 4,200 postcards sent out, almost unprecedented to everyone in the coastal zone, right? 500 emails, lots of public meetings and engagements. And, and we don't go out when we're all the way finished and say, we're all the way finished, what do you think, right? We, we respond to public comment. We change things routinely, even in these last stages and what we hear today, we can see, see things that need to be changed. So the, the public outreach is, is extensive, uh, lengthy, and, and part of the, the very foundation of what we do in the planning department. So I always am, am wondering what it is that people don't think that they have an opportunity with, with, when they have so many opportunities to, to participate in the process. And so if there's something else that, that uh, Richard thinks that we can be doing or should be doing to notify people and get the word out, we, we hold meetings right there in the fire station. We hold meetings in Port Wayne all the way up and down the coast when we're having coastal. And, and you can see that in, 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 in response by response in that 89-page document. Just uh, to the issue of the, of the deed restriction, because I, I, I find that document um, interesting, and, and, and Jeff will probably have more to say about it, but I'm not sure what we could see different in this document that we wouldn't see in other documents all up and down the coast. So I, I have a copy of the deed restriction, and it's very specific. So Mr. Harbison says that there's nothing special about the views or access to Sea Cliff, and therefore, you know, people shouldn't be allowed, or we shouldn't put the coastal trail, or we shouldn't even look at that. I think what's special about it is it's the California coast, right? And this decision had already been made back in in uh, in 1983, and it was very specific. It says, whereas the commission found that but for the imposition of the above condition, and the above condition says that they're going to acknowledge the rights of public to lateral access of passive recreation, that's walking, running, sunbathing, swimming, surfing, picnicking, and fishing for parcel B. That's, and they said, the Coastal Commission said, were it not for this imposition of this condition, um, it, it couldn't be found consistent with the public access provisions of section 30210 and 30212, and that the permit could not, therefore, have been granted. So absent them granting that access, and it's, it's clear public access, they would not have been granted the permit. So um, I'm happy to have the, the more in-depth, because I, I, you know, I clearly understand what the issue is going to be, um, that it is a, a gated community, but this gated community is open in this section of it upon the revetment to the public, and that is not uncommon throughout the state of California. So if we make a different decision here, I would think that lots of separate homeowners associations are wondering, you know, and then, and then that is a, a whole different conversation that we're going to have with the Coastal Commission. So I'm happy to take the information they have, sit down with the local Coastal Commission staff and, and um, the homeowners association and their attorneys and really look through the document and, and see what the Coastal Commission has to say. So that, that's, that's the two points that I wanted to make, but I'm sure 
Aaron and Rosemary have other things to say. I yeah, I can briefly reply to the different comments. I mean, so basically, um, you know, this, the Sea Cliff uh, deed restriction is a publicly accessible easement, as Kim noted, and it was agreed upon. Um, as I mentioned earlier, that you know we need to figure out whether the Coastal Commission intended for it to tra traverse the entire seawall there, or whether it is just sort of a seasonal, fluctuational. Uh, public access uh, trail and but basically either way it doesn't really r provide the impetus to remove the whole segment off of the map um, in terms of the the privacy issues you know um, that trail is is consistent with the standards that are in the recreation and access section requiring at least a 10 foot separation between lateral easements and residences so there's already standards for that and those standards is that residences or private property line <clears throat> it is those are, those are for lateral access easements correct that doesn't yes <laughs> lateral okay. access easements and uh, when developing a new development um, it should be 10 feet from a residential structure except when it involves a seawall and that provides adequate separation so it could be even less than 10 feet according to a seawall now <clears throat> so that's that's in the existing coastal zoning ordinance today furthermore we we did our best to respect the private property rights issues in terms of developing this plan that is consistent with the state law in the terms in the sense that we didn't call for new trails on private property yet uh, the the, goal, oh, Trump the goals in uh, goal three calls for respects for the rights of private of private property owners. They're allowed to, uh, in some instances, when they would not impact you know, public views, includes uh, s small security fences to guide uh, users along the pathway. <clears throat> and We also emphasize voluntary transactions, prioritize those first. And um, we cannot use Hobson Road, which is, is identified as a potential alternative in the plan, uh, because there is an existing deed restriction or public access easement on that road already. So again, as the agency that enforces the Coastal Act here with the certified LCP, it's our responsibility to provide public access to the coast. This is an existing public access point and public access facility that allows people to walk and run on it according to the deed restriction. That appears consistent with the, with the uh, intent. The coastal trail is consistent with that intent. And it, it is our responsibility, in essence, to include that segment into the coastal trail, which is a broader effort to provide public access to the citizens of California. So the overall, that's the perspective. <clears throat> I think in response to some of the other comments, we look forward to working further with the equestrian folks to identify additional trails. As I mentioned, we identify that the trails that are closest to the ocean as be, and which ones allow horses right now. Um, I think we would need to get the information about you know where these people uh, ride their horses, where the equestrians, what trails they use now, and which ones are designated to allow those uses in order to provide more information into the plan uh, for that effort. So that takes coordination with both the constituents and the state parks representatives. <clears throat> Looking forward to doing that as part of the master plan process. And... <clears throat> We appreciate the presentation by the surf rider folks. And I think that would be included in the list of uh, minor additions to this project before it goes to the board where we could amend the program, uh, program one, to include uh, an evaluation of how parking affects access to the coastal trail. <clears throat> um, we would also include these comments provided by the city of Oxnard on the map regarding Ormond Beach. Uh, double check that the facilities at Silver Strand Beach are included in the coastal trail, which include the parking areas 
at the end of the revetment by the seawall. And right now, I think we're standing with the current staff recommendation, which is to include the Seacliff Beach Colony uh, trail in the revetment as a segment that needs improvements because according to our reading of it, that would be consistent with the uh, original agreement and the Coastal Commission's intent when processing the permits for those facilities. In terms of the guardrail issues, we did add, include a policy for that in response to that comment. Uh, that is included in policy 2.17 says coastal trail improvements shall be designed to minimize adverse impacts on views of scenic resources and public viewing areas. So that would include the roadway there. And, and the idea would be to balance the safety needs with the users and the, and the guardrails, you know, with minimizing the adverse impacts to the scenic resources. <clears throat> and in response to the public involvement process issues, we, um, you know, we did do outreach for the wireless communication facilities ordinance for the non-coastal zone. We went out with boards and had people you know, tell us what type of wireless facilities they prefer. Uh, generally speaking, it was to blend the facilities as much as possible. Um, minimize the visual impacts and that was consistent with the feedback that we received during this outreach period as well amongst the community. We did actually make a change to the wireless ordinance in response to that gentleman's comments. Uh, we removed the uh, public rights away that are eligible scenic highways from the preferred locations list so that would ensure that um, we don't encourage facilities being put on poles in the rights away in areas such as Point Magoo where it's a really scenic highway. We, for the coastal trail, we encourage additional uh, outreach as part of that master plan program. We hope to get the grants for that and be able to work with the residents and the folks further to really nail down the coastal trail plan in a lot more detail and gather their feedback on where additional segments can be included, maybe where segments would be removed. So that program does discuss including a amendment to the coastal area plan to update this program. Right now, as I mentioned earlier, we're trying to sort of get the foot in the door, get, begin the process for planning this facility, and there's plenty of opportunities for future, uh, future public stakeholder involvement, which is, actually, which is absolutely necessary for the success of the facility. <clears throat> and we, I, I think it would be rare that there would be a a permit for a residential unit that would require an easement for the coastal trail. I think that uh, the worst case scenario would be if the road need, would need to be a road would need to be widened a little bit to include a trail in it, and that could involve um, a little bit of additional right of way. But in terms of we, we were carefully worked that worked through that language so that there would have to be a nexus or rough proportionality under the law in order to require any trail easements. And so that couches those statements within the plethora of case law precedent, such as Nolan and Dolan, and those different agencies, those different trials. So I think those are my comments. I won't, uh, I, I agree with the comments, obviously, from my planning director. And uh, thank you, Aaron, for being so detailed in your responses. Um, just to be a little more specific, staff is recommending that the proposal that goes to the board would modify figure one point, I'm sorry, 4.1.6 plus its associated table to incorporate the comments from the city of Oxnard. We're also recommending that program number one be updated to more clearly identify that coastal access parking uh, should be addressed as part of that planning process and also that uh, coordination with the Harbor District should also be part of that process. We, we did coordinate with the Harbor District, but if there's further coordination that is appropriate, we would do that as part of that process and that we would clarify program one before we went to the board to, to address that issue. And, and that addresses, I think it was 
Jackie Pinion's um, concern regarding Channel Islands Harbor and Fisherman's Wharf? Uh, to some degree, yes. Okay. Um, it, it doesn't resolve the regulatory problem that she's concerned about, which is simply that our local coastal program does not cover the Harbor District. The Harbor District has its own certified plan. Um, so those are those are the changes that we yes I'm sorry. Uh, comment on uh, on the on the Harbor District issue. Uh, yeah, on the parking, as I said before, the Harbor, Channel Islands Harbor is responsible for for the maintenance of that parking. Um, and they were, they were reminded of that about a year or two ago after they'd, they'd uh, put a gate on the drive off of Ocean into the parking area at La Janelle because they hadn't maintained it and, it, and sand intrusion and everything else. It kept it, made it unserviceable. Um, I think it took Supervisor's office, Supervisor Jergo's office to remind uh, the director that they had funding their funding included maintenance of that parking lot. Since then, obviously, it's been opened and maintained. Uh, so that's why it's important to make sure that's coordinated as part of that process. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I think uh, enough has probably been said about the public outreach process, but if you have any additional questions, we can certainly, we're here to respond. I would like to, um, again, clarify Although Aaron did address this issue that our, we have really focused, we've made every attempt to focus on public land and public, uh, publicly available uh, easements or lateral access provisions that currently exist as part of this process. If there are any additional trails that would be added as part of the master planning process, this commission would have every opportunity to, res to review those and to address those issues at that time, but those are not before the commission today. Um, and with respect to the sea cliff, um, I don't, at the risk of somewhat repeating myself previously, we believe that the current proposal, um, as documented in your documents, does reflect the existing legal provisions for the sea cliff colony. That said, when we met with the homeowners yesterday and their attorney, their main concern is that the very end of that path is goes on to private property and is not on parcel B. And their contention to us is that the Coastal Commission understood that and they only intended for that path to be on parcel B. So what we promised them and will uh, commit to you that we will do before the board hearing is that we will meet with the Coastal Commission staff um, to try to confirm their statement regarding that. Um, if their statement is true, we probably would reclassify that. We wouldn't want to pull it off the map, but we would reclassify it as a seasonally available pathway because it is not on private property until you get to the last stair. They informed us they have a, a sign there already informing people that coastal access goes down to the stair at that point onto the beach. So how exactly we would address that really depends on what the agreement was. But um, I can let council address this a bit more because he's more familiar than I am with the actual agreements. But it's our understanding that that public access was part of the original agreement and therefore should logically be part of our plan. So. Yeah, I don't have a whole lot to add. I guess my take on it from a legal perspective, um, you know, I, and I appreciate meeting with, um, with Mr. Harbison and the HOA's attorney yesterday. Um, my take on their issue is, as, as um, Rosemary said, the last part of the, um, the trail on the south or, or, or west end, the, there's a path that currently deviates from parcel B and it, it goes inland uh, maybe 100 feet. You could, you could see it on the, the overheads. And so the HOA's position is that that was never the intended um, route for the path. And, 
and and I, I tend to agree with them, but still, in my mind, legally, um, that doesn't mean that there was never an intent for there to be a legal, or I'm sorry, a lateral, lateral public access route um, on parcel B going south. And, and the HOA's point is, well, that's on the revetment itself, and that was never the intent to have a path there, and there never was a path there, so therefore, the intent was to stop and, and not to have a through route. That's not reflected in the, in the Coastal Commission staff reports that I reviewed. The Coastal Commission said that people d did historically go all the way down through the Sea Cliff development to the county park. Um, and so again, we need to discuss this with uh, the Coastal Commission. But in my mind, it's, you know, that's, it's a detail and it's not, um, you know, obviously it's, it's ultimately a policy decision for you, but I don't see it as a legal impediment, you know, one way or another for showing that portion on, on a, a coastal trail map. It's, it's more details where exactly is a public access right in that area, and that's what we need to hammer down. And it kind of goes to the, the broader point that, that's been made to you a few times today is this is a high-level planning document that we're looking at today, and we're not, we're not creating new property rights. We're not, we're not creating a new trail. We're, just, we're saying, all right, here's, here's the routes that we need to take a, a you know, harder look at, we need to, to work on. Um, and so this is one of those spots that it, it's going to require follow-up. So. Was there anything that you'd wanted to add to that information that we got that there is a fence that extends into the ocean at Hobson Park? Yeah, my understanding is, and this is another planning issue, my understanding there is, in, in fact, a fence there. And my understanding is it's a county fence. I'm not sure if it's the county or HOA, but it's a county GSA parks fence. And so in order for there to be a through trail there, that fence would need to be removed in, in part or in whole. And so that's another coordination issue with, with county parks. And another impediment is my understanding is if, if that lateral access from Sea Cliff did go through to the Hobson Park, there's a campsite like literally right there where it would go through. So they'd have to um, reconfigure that campsite in the park. So again, it's, it's a planning issue and, and that would need to be resolved for there to actually be a public through route right there as opposed to having the count, the, I'm sorry, the public go down onto the beach, walk around the fence, back into the park. Thank you. Is there any more from staff? Are there any questions of staff at this time? I have one just regarding wireless. Is there any way we can take out that interchangeable capacity versus coverage in the portion regarding the um, wireless communications facilities. Do the, the, the part about demonstrating a capacity or coverage gap? I, I wish my computer worked so I could find it exactly, but the, the terms are used interchangeably uh -huh, and right. they're not interchangeable uh -huh. at all. So, well, we, we met, we had consultants for in the, during the last phase that, were, that included an attorney and, and he said that the two capacity and coverage are interchangeable under the provisions of the Telecommunications Act needing to fill a gap in coverage. I, ha I have no doubt that the, their attorney said that. Um, <laughs> However, <laughs> I, d I don't believe that that's actually the case and that there is a distinction and it serves the county's purpose to use that as, as a, a tool in our limited toolbox with um, you know, ensuring that um, that the rollout is orderly and uh, well planned. That that's, sounds like a legal issue, and that it honestly wasn't on my radar, and I haven't looked at it. But I um, will promise you that I'll look look at it because I understand the implications um, and importance of it. So I I can promise that. It I I would feel more comfortable if if I looked into it before. Aaron or planning just promised to, to take it out um, today because I haven't looked at that issue yet. Commissioner Dukas, what we can promise is to take a second look at it before we go to the board. Um, this is just a recollection, but I do, as I recall, we did focus on coverage 
not capacity. And so there, I think you are correct that there may be a distinction and we need to look into that a little further. I'm not sure why we, okay. We'll be happy to look at it before we go to the board. Yeah. And, and again, I, I have, I do not doubt your word that, that you were informed by their attorney that they are interchangeable. But we have a federal preemption on coverage and there it's, there's a whole mess of case law with capacity issues. And in as much as, as I'd like us to use a completely different uh, planning mechanism, I'd like to see the, that propagation maps and uh, because it's, it's my opinion that this is a, a, a planned sequence. This is a, a network where uh, th they interconnect and we never look at the whole of the action. We piecemeal these things together. That's the way it's always been done and I think it's wrong. So that's what I think about that. So at this point, having no more comments or questions, I'll close the public hearing and entertain a motion. Well, I have some comments. Oh, you have comments? Yes. Would you like to make a motion as well? Not yet. Okay. Commissioner Onstott. I understand and appreciate this is not a final document, but it is setting goals and objectives and policies. The existing policy in the coastal zone was to accept uh, dedications of easement. That's a voluntary situation. And we are told in staff documents and otherwise that uh, to the extent feasible trail design shall consider and respect private privacy and property and then it goes on to say locating the coastal trail on private land should be limited whenever possible to voluntary transactions with willing landowners however trail segments may be acquired through other legal means such as conditions of approval for discretionary development i understand that and we had a conversation with county council and I asked him, I said, what's the legal basis for conditioning discretionary permits uh, on dedication of easements? And I think he and I would agree to disagree. Um, and we are led to believe that where possible, we will pursue the voluntary path. And yet, when I look at proposed coastal area plan, when they talk about new um, vertical access easements for new development and lateral access easements. They say granting an easement to allow vertical access to mean high tide shall be mandatory. And they say the same thing for lateral easements. I have a hard time reconciling that. I have a basic disagreement with staff and with legal counsel, and I suppose there's some open questions there. What I really have a problem with is not so much the discretion of our planning director, but I would like to see language develop in which there should be a balancing act of some kind, and I don't want the easements to be mandatory. I, I don't mind having a planning director have discretion, but I would require that factors be taken into consideration and I'd want it planted here in the goals and, and policies and programs to guide in the decision whether or not to compel an unwilling property owner to dedicate his property. And it seems to me issues of privacy are important Financial impacts important. Obligations to maintain and repair. Setbacks would be important. And I'm not proposing that this tool be taken away, but I think guidelines should be built into this document that would allow some, boy, some person at some point in time or entity to contest the discretionary decision as an abuse of discretion if these factors weren't taken into consideration. Of course, no mention anywhere of purchasing an easement or a right of way. Apparently, there's no money available anyway. So 
So we're moving from the coastal zoning ordinance that says obtained by offer of dedication to a mandatory condition extraction from a property owner. I would propose that language mandatory be dropped and within the, somehow within the discretion of the, assume in this case it's the planning director or is it the planning commission? I assume it's the planning commission, is it not? On a discretionary permit? County council? Who has a decision under this, these proposals? Does it come before us or does it go to the planning director? On individual project, it would, it would depend on the decision maker for the permit. Um, so, yeah, it, you'd have to look at the use matrix and what, what the permit is. I guess if it's a residence, maybe it, it wouldn't come to you. It would not. It wouldn't. But I, you know, I just want to point out. I, I believe the language you're you're citing to about the the vertical access easements was was in our our plan previously. So that that's not new language. Um, and I understand your concern. Um, you know, as I told you, layered on top of all that language is the the nexus and ref proportionality constitutional requirements that always exist and. I have no legal issue whatsoever specifically citing to that. Um, you know, that's just the law. And we wouldn't act otherwise, but um, I think that, that caveat could be added. Um, and I know I'm going off from your original right. question. Well, I would like to see, I, I don't mind the discretion, but I would like to see some criteria at which it will be evaluated. I'd, I don't like the silence as to that issue. And All kinds of politics affect lots of people in lots of ways, and we're talking about setting policies and goals, and this will go on for decades, potentially. Well, and, and, um, and to push back against that, I don't have, uh, you know, the, the meets and bounds on where their, their properties are and the encroaching ocean and what the right is for the public to pass on the seasonal portion of that. Uh, this, this easement portion up on a structure, it's not, it's not a permanent thing, and it's, and it's, and it's a permitted structure uh, that is subject to change. Um, I think that uh, we're, we're, like, we're not even walking on sand. You know, this is, this, uh, yeah, I, I I don't have the legal expertise, and I don't have enough information to um, to 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 support you on that. I just don't have the. You don't have to. But I I agree that if we're creating something that's a statewide trail that's going to be published, it should be something that is, to the best of our knowledge, going to be available year round and permanently. I mean. Are we, are we talking about just sea cliff now, or what? Is it? No, I'm talking in I'm I'm talking in general because a couple of things have come up. Of well, this might be available seasonally. Um, I think being right on the ocean, um, there are just so many variables with um, tides and erosion that we need to be careful about. Um, about establishing something that's going to be published and relied upon when people are planning to hike the whole coast of but, California. But, but, this is, but this is state law. I mean, this is totally out of our hands. This is state law. This is, this is something that goes back to the 70s. But we do have the Pacific Bike Trail, and so, you know, that's pretty well established. It's pretty close to the ocean, and it seems like we can follow that you know, in regards to Sea Cliff, even it it is a viable option to use that section of PCH, which is already a bike trail. So, anyway, that's just my thoughts on on the permanency of what we're doing while we're while we're still um, adhering to the Coastal Act. Do we, have, do we have a motion, or is there anybody? Uh, we're just talking. I, 
Uh, I would concur with Commissioner Kelly's comments. We've got, uh, as we, particularly as specifically as it relates to the Seacliff area, uh, that we have a, a bike designated bike path that runs parallel to the community on the, and granted it's, it doesn't front the ocean, but you know, we're dealing with a situation where the public's, we have the public's right to access the ocean, ocean, the beach, but regressing from that, Caltrans created the problem there when they put that overpass in there and stopped that natural transmission of sand down the coast with the tides to keep that beach replenished that caused the emergency uh, revetment to be put in in the first place. Now, Cal, Coast Commission is, is in essence what they've done. They've transferred their obligation to the public's access to the beach off the beach onto that revetment, and and it just and that creates I think that creates a hardship that never was intended to be on those homeowners. It's 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 seasonal. Well, yeah, it's seasonal, but in in the process now we're talking about the potential issue of of. Uh, of um, Access, uh, access from a property, private property, to create an easement uh, uh, counter to what the property owner's rights might or desires might be. Uh, I think uh, you know, uh, Commissioner Onstott uh, said it more elo eloquently than I can say it. Um, um, I think there's an issue there, and and if, if it was to me, if I, if it was up to me to make a decision right now, I'd say. That, that beach access should go on the roadside and not along the revetment. That's, that's the only, the only uh, other comment I would make about that. <laughs> We're wandering. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, first of all, Commissioner Onstott, I believe maybe you were speaking more broad-based in the wording of mandatory. And the fact that we might want to have the provisions to actually have some discretion on whether we do something mandatory or not, and whether that would be the planning director's um, role is to maybe review what's what what would have what we'd have the ability in this document to do as mandatory. They would maybe instead take and look at it from a discretionary perspective. Well, I wouldn't start with the language mandatory. Yeah. I would say that it would be within the planning, within whoever is, whoever is dealing with the discretionary permit, taking into consideration those, those issues to make a decision. Yes. But I don't want to start with mandatory. Yes. And I, and I, would, um, I would agree with you on that. And then the second thing that I'd like to say is I, I completely um, can sympathize and understand the position from the Seacliff um, Home Homeowners Association. And what I look at is that there is already an existing um, pathway that's being used and has been being used for years. Uh, and even um, stated that it's, you know, there's no problem with the surfers using it and everybody else. And so if we're looking at it from the perspective of having maybe two coastal trail options, one is seasonal and the other is, um, could be used um, multi-modal, right? Um, why wouldn't we, why would we then exclude that if there are two options? There are a number of areas in the backcountry and, and other um, hiking trails where it does say, you know, open seasonally. Still looking for that motion. Well, this document provides a framework for um, for and a process for going forward to create this coastal trail. So it's there are a lot of um, details that still need to be worked out. But if we have any um, 
anything from the, the general level that we need to have included, then somebody needs to make a motion. I have a question, staff. Do you have a problem with the language that I was proposing, giving whoever the, who's responsible for the discretionary permit, whether it's you or this commission, not have, not, not have that mandatory language regarding imposing conditions, but some reasonable criteria to, to review in making that decision? What is the importance of having a mandatory? I understand and appreciate there's no money, so we're not going to be condemning anything, and people are less than likely to be voluntarily giving up land, especially in the coastal area. So I understand why, from a planning standpoint, you would like the situation to be mandatory, but I just find it abhorrent to me. So, um, Commissioner Onstad, I would say that the the word mandatory has been in there, and if I had to guess, it's probably been in there for 30 years. It, we're not adding the word mandatory. It's always been mandatory. Well, and I'm so, asking that you take it out, I guess, then. But I don't I, care but how then long it's been there. It says, the language says, for all new development as defined by Section 30212 of the Coastal Act. So I'd have to look at that section very quickly. But the only thing that it says that you can make the findings to not have it mandatory, and it's mandatory up and down the state. Lateral and vertical beach access is just a, a ABC of the Coastal Act, right? You're, you, you get it every time, and, and, it's, and it's mandatory. But the, the way that you don't get it is when you make the findings pursuant to the Section A there that are consistent with 30212 of the Coastal Access that is inconsistent with either public safety, military security needs, or that agriculture would be adversely affected. So when we're looking at getting the public's access to the beach, we look to see if it would impact either of those three things before making the decision. But I would have to say in my 20 years of doing it that it hasn't been an issue. It hasn't ever been an issue. The, the, the granting or receiving the vertical or lateral access. And for the most part, we already have it in the coast. The coast is almost fully built out, so the, the easements that we have are pretty much the easements that we're going to get. So, I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not opposed to your extra uh, words or things that you would want to have in there, to, but I would say that you know, in 90% of these cases, it's probably a planning director level decision, as are all single family homes built on the beach. And in my 20 years of experience in, in processing them, managing them, and now being the director, it's just not been an issue. And, and it's part of the Coastal Act. You don't care that it's part of the post on that. No, well, I, do, I, well, I, don't, I, I do think I would that we add have to the, comply with the Coastal those Act. It's the, just one of the language. framework of the things that we have to comply with. Still looking for that motion. Not for me. Okay, I will um, entertain a motion to adopt staff recommendations uh, with the following provisions that we are going to include something with regards to the guardrails. Uh, the uniform parking and the further review of the sea cliff area um, so that there are more details that can come before the board of directors uh, board of supervisors meeting uh, are you amenable to include the 4.1.6 uh, regarding the city of Oxnard and coordination of with the harbor district yes did we miss anything do we have a second? We have a motion. Is there a second? A second. Is there any further discussion? Uh, uh, I, w I will not be able to support this because I, d I can't move forward with that capacity versus coverage issue. <laughs> and um, uh, you don't have to explain. now we're the point uh, where we vote. Why am I not getting it to come up? Because you have to hit the vote button. Oh, yes, the new one. Uh, 
I do want to say one thing. Um, going over this, uh, this report, I was so grateful and so impressed with how perfect it was. The every you, usually when I go through these things, I go through with a fine tooth comb and I find little niggling things that just get under. I found nothing. Everything that was um, uh, omitted came with an explanation. The response to comments, I didn't have to go back and forth between two two documents. Everything was just it just flowed. And it made doing this huge amount of reading in a fairly short amount of time, even though we have an outstanding clerk who gets us these things just as soon as they come in. There's, there's no delay. I just want to say um, how outstanding this report was done. I was really, really grateful for it. I would second that. I would agree as well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Me too. So, uh, Chair Dukas, I'd like to just chime in here for a minute because um, I have the, uh, the privilege, I suppose, of reading lots of different staff reports from very small accessory structures to this one. And I had that same feeling. I went and found um, Aaron and Rosemary and, and really expressed that to them. It's a very dense topic to get through and the fact that they could do it in, in uh, 30, less than 30 pages. And I think that's a lot in, in to our esteemed county council over here who maybe knocked it down by half and uh, and and Rosemary and I do want to acknowledge um, Rosemary is retiring yes this is her last hearing so although she'll be here in until January and going forward to the board with this and another project it's her last hearing and it's extremely important um, the role that she has played in the planning department I mean these are big you know policy deep discussions to have and so to bring these forward and to bring the last set forward where you talk about you know filming in the coastal trail and and wireless and you have to get your mind around all of these policy issues these federal laws these state laws um, all of the p different players especially in something as complicated as trail planning and Rosemary does work nights and weekends she's here almost every day when I leave she's you know working on the weekends to make sure that you get these very detailed reports because she is a perfectionist and I love that about her and I'm going to miss that about her uh, <laughs> I think it's hard on her staff but I love it and you love it and, and they're going to be better off for it so I just wanted to to make sure you won't see her again so I wanted to really recognize her efforts publicly Thank you very much, and I just want to say it's been a pleasure working with all of you. You're a terrific commission. Thank you. Thank you very much. You will be missed. So uh, moving on to the next agenda item, if, if you're done here, you, you don't have to stay for a whole meeting if you don't want to. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming, and uh, thanks for your input. Our next item is the overview of our current film permit program. Oh, you know what? Before you go, I didn't even check with my commission. I'm sorry. Do you want to do you want to move forward or do you want to take a 5 minute break? Let's finish. Let's just finish. Yeah. Let's finish. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Can we get the I should have checked program? first. All right, good afternoon, Chair Dukas and fellow commissioners. My name is Thomas Chafee, and I'm the Film Permit Coordinator here at the County of Ventura. I'm going to be giving an overview on the Film Permit Program and some enhancements that we're making towards the end. I'd like to start off in our, uh, the most typical type of filming we do see here in the county are commercials. Um, we have a lot of agricultural land uses and a lot of coastal roadways that they like to use for these commercials. Um, these are just an example of some of the commercials that were filmed during the 2015 calendar year. Um, as you can see, quite a bit of farming stuff, quite a bit of car commercials. Oops. 
And then the next type we get quite often are the TV series. Um, Criminal Minds um, and Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Um, are reoccurring TV series that like to use um, the Newhall land area, Newhall film area, and Ventura Farms up in Hidden Valley. Um, Master Chef also uses Underwood Farms a lot um, for their challenges. Um, and I believe Gordon Ramsay's house is actually located in the Santa Monica Mountains. They do quite a bit of filming there as well. Now the biggest ones we get are the feature films. Um, they don't come through as often, but they're a lot more involved. Um, during 2015, The Revenant was filmed at Big Sky Ranch outside of Simi Valley. A Secret in Their Eyes was filmed in the Hidden Valley area. And then Concussion was filmed at right around Rio Mesa School outside of Oxnard. Now the uh, production companies use what this is called as a 30 mile zone for filming. And it's a 30 mile um, circumference taken from the intersection of it's Los Virginis in Beverly, or La Cienega in Beverly in downtown Los Angeles. Now they use this for their per diem rate for union productions. Um, anything outside of this radius, they have to pay for hotels, gas, mileage, everything like that, regardless if they are staying the night or not. Um, they do make exemptions. Piru, although it's right outside of the radius, um, it is included within it. So they make certain exemptions. Piru gets quite a bit of filming because of that. This is our locations, our filming locations throughout 2015. Um, as you can see, most of it, most of the filming occurs on the western port or the eastern portion of the county due to that 30 mile zone. A lot of Hidden Valley, a lot of Piru, and a lot in Big Sky Ranch outside of Simi Valley. Now this is a bar graph of the film permits we've issued um, throughout the last 10 years. Um, it's been pretty consistent um, up until the last couple years. Now this has to do with the recently enacted California tax credits they've been given out. Um, to better compete with Georgia, who was stealing a lot of the productions, they put together tax credits that were enacted at the beginning of 2015, which significantly increased the permits issued and film days in the county. There are two main types of film permits we issue. The standard film permit, which are your basic interior, um, not going before the hours of 7 a.m., not going after the hour of 10 p.m. Um, no adverse impacts on surrounding residents, no pyrotechnics, no explosions, no gunfire. Um, and then everything else, so if you're filming before 7 a.m. or after 10 p.m., you're going to need the film permit with waivers. Even if you're filming within 7 a.m. and 10 p.m., and if you're having pyrotechnics, anything that could cause adverse impacts on the neighbors, we still will require the waivers. And also, if they're blocking the roadway for more than three minutes, a full road closure will also require the waivers for the surrounding residents. Uh, the encroachment, they will also require an encroachment permit through Transportation Division, which has their own requirements for waivers. So actually, when they close the roadway, they get waivers from the Planning Division and the Encroachment Department. Encroachment uses all the impacted residents. We use the radius of all the residents that, would, that we typically use for the, uh, the waivers. Standard film permit process, production company submits the application, we review it to see if it allows filming. If they have a violation on the property or it's not a legal lot, we don't allow the filming. Um, we'll review the application, we assess the fees, we distribute the application to all the uh, interested parties, all the responsible agencies within the county. Uh, fire department, tax collector are the main ones, but if they're using helicopters, drones, we do do the FAA. If they're using animals, animal services gets a copy. Uh, we make sure um, everything they're doing is reviewed. For the standard permit process, it's a typical one-day turnaround. We collect fees, issue the permit, make sure everything's good. Standard is the easiest, quickest, has the less, least amount of impacts on the residents. Now, the permit requiring waivers is where it gets a little more involved. Um, anytime they're doing anything after hours or anything that would impact the neighbors, special effects, lighting, um, we require them to get neighborhood signatures. Um, we have them send in a site map of where they're placing their generators, where they're doing crew parking, where they're doing the actual filming. Um, we send that site map to our GIS department. They make a map and they give us a list of residents. We provide that to the permitting company who goes door to door and has to have residents sign, approve, they have a comment section. Um, 
we need 50% plus one. They have to distribute the waivers to every resident within that radius, whether it's taping it to the door, knocking on the door, 100% of the residents need that waiver. 50% plus one of those residents has to check approved, sign, they have a place for comments, phone number. If they don't sign it and they don't check approved, we can't accept it. Now we recently enacted the, well, the Acela Citizens Access Program is a web-based program that allows the citizens to log on whenever they want and they can research um, permits that have been submitted that are in process or that have been approved. So if there's something going on in their neighborhood, they can look it up by address, they can look it up by permit number, they can look it up by a lot of different areas to figure out what's going on. Adding on to that, we're, we started with the online film permitting process. Phase one allowed the permit companies to pay by credit card. Um, we re require payment before we issue the actual film permit. So typically they would have to run down here with a, a check runner or they would have to overnight the check um, in order to get their permit approved in time instead of using snail mail which could take three to five days and they're on a very short time limit so it, it's very restrictive for them. So we allowed them to pay by credit card so they can just go on pay by credit card immediately which increased how quickly we can approve these permits. Phase two we just recently implemented on September 6th. This allows them to completely apply, submit, pay for the permits, upload documents, download their approved permit, everything remotely. So if they were working late on a Friday night, they could submit the permit Friday night. I'd come in Monday morning, review the permit, do everything remotely. They can pay remotely and we can get it all done within that day. Now the local coastal plan amendment um, was approved by your commission, I believe it was beginning of this year, if, I, if I'm March. correct, beginning of this year. Um, and it went to the board, which was approved by the board, and it's now going to the California Coastal Commission. Um, that's going to be going September 6th, and, or sorry, December 6th and 7th. Um, we're getting it on the agenda. Um, that is going to open up filming within the coastal zone. Right now we don't allow after-hour filming anywhere in the coastal zone um, or any waiver permits at all in the coastal zone. In the residential coastal zone, we don't allow filming at all. It's completely um, not allowed. Um, so in order to keep it in line with the California Coastal Commission's procedures and our non-coastal zoning ordinance, we're making some adjustments to allow the filming in the residential areas, but with more restrictions. Um, so we're going to open it up in the, all, all the, all the high-density coastal residential areas we're going to open up filming to um, with exemption. There was, oh, that'll be on the next page. Sorry about that. Um, it would more clearly define film regulations in the coastal zone to be consistent with the non-coastal zoning ordinance. Um, it adheres to the requirements of the Coastal Commission and its enhanced regulations. So we, we understand that it's more sensitive in these residential communities. Um, we're going to require more um, notifications um, besides, um, here, I'll move on to the next one here. So film permit procedures require an applicant to show that film production activities will not interfere with the public's right of access to the sea, public recreation areas, or have the potential to impact coastal resources. Uh, due to the small lot size, neighborhood consent is required for all filming activities within the residential beach and residential beach harbor zones. So since those are so small, parking's very restricted, we're going to require neighborhood consent regardless if you're doing just indoor regular hour filming or not. Neighborhood consent is required in all other zones. If you're filming before 7 a.m. or after 10 p.m. on weekdays, it's going to move to 8 a.m., 8 p.m. on weekends. Now, that's mainly for public beach access. Um, on the weekends, it gets a lot busier in the beach area, so we want to limit it a little bit more. And then for the road closures, neighborhood consent is also required for road closures longer than three minutes, loud noise filming, exterior night lighting, anything that may have an adverse impact on the neighbors. Complaints and enforcement. Now, most large productions, um, they'll require a fire safety officer on site. The fire safety officer acts as kind of the eyes and ears for us at the planning division. If we get a call, somebody's complaining, there's an FSO on site, we can have them confirm, deny, we can have them move vehicles. Um, they're pretty helpful when the need arises, we call them, they can do stuff for us. They're not there at all productions, the very small photo shoots, all indoor, they don't require the FSO. We don't have that benefit um, with the smaller productions. 
Production is requiring an encroachment permit. If they're using the roadway, if they're using the sidewalks, they'll always have um, an inspector on site. So just recently we had an issue with the Piru streets. I was able to call the inspector. We got a call from the post office. There was a truck parked in front of the post office. Called the inspector. The inspector had it moved immediately and the post office was happy. So they also come in handy when we get complaints and we have a no FSO, but we have an encroachment permit. We can still get somebody out there to make adjustments. And then of the 358 permits that I've issued in 2015 and over 1,000 days of filming, um, we only received one formal complaint. And that was in Piru. Um, production company was using fake snow. Neighbor had an issue with what chemicals were being used. Um, we addressed that complaint um, with environmental health, planning division, code enforcement. We all came together and addressed his needs. And then this is a little picture. It has my, um, the email address, film.permitsaventura.org. That's accessible for everybody. They, I, when I'm not here, we have backups that keep an eye on it. So if somebody emails and I'm out of the office, somebody is looking at that email address. That's our new direct film permit website. Um, and that's a little picture of when they transformed downtown Piru. And then I think that's it. I'm available for any questions, comments. <laughs> I'm sure yes. <laughs> Do you go by Thomas? Thomas, Thomas, yes. Thomas, quick question for you. Um, a permit can be for how many days? Up to how many days? It depends on the location. Okay, um, in a residential area. In a residential area, um, I believe it's up to 60 days in a 180 day period. Okay. So, in a residential area, the time frame right now for filming is 7 to 10 p.m. Correct. That's yes. correct. And they can actually stay filming for 60 days from 7 to 10 p.m. Um, is that correct? Oh, I would have to double. I think it's, I think that's correct, yes. Okay. So I'm going to just go back in time to a recent incident that happened um, to me personally. And the fact that um, one of our neighbors decided to hire a film crew, which we later, later determined did not actually apply for a permit, um, and was able to continue to film every day from 7 in the morning till 10 p.m., which unfortunately isn't really 10 p.m. That's when they finish filming, but that's not necessarily when they finish getting everybody into cars, everything put away, and create a lot of outside noise in doing that. Um, so I'm curious as to, first of all, what we have in place to ensure that neighbors aren't being um, interrupted after 10 p.m. And I do think 10 p.m. is too late in a residential area, to be honest with you. But then the other issue that I do have is this 50% plus one. Uh, I was never given um, a form to fill out about this and it was done specifically because the neighbor knew that we would not be happy with the way that they had set up the filming. So I have and I also have a problem with that. How do you ensure that all neighbors within that 300 foot um, area are getting a form and having a bit the ability to comment on the film production that's going to take place? All right. Yeah. Um Sorry, I don't mean to no, no, that's you with a bunch fine. of questions. Um, the 7 to 10 thing, they, yeah. they cannot be on site before 7 or after 10. That includes catering, that includes any vehicles, any crew parking, anything. Okay. So if they're after that, they're in violation of their permit. Um, the 100% distributing to 100% of the residents, it's very hard for me to actually verify that. Yeah. We give them the list, we verify that they have the right waiver form filled out. They say they do it to 100%. There's no actual way for me to physically determine if they have done that or not. Um, the, the, that, that incident, we did not issue a permit to them. Um, they were filming illegally. We went out. Um, we did put a violation on the property, notice of alleged violation. The problem is, is with code enforcement, there's a 30-day period from alleged violation and actual violation to where we can't stop them from getting that permit. So once we put the alleged violation on the property owner, the production company came and applied for their permit. Mm -hmm. We can't deny them that permit until that 30-day time limit was up. So there was no way for me to say, sorry, I can't issue this permit. Um, we did send code enforcement out there. The property owner did get a notice of violation on his property. Um, the problem is, is these productions come and go. Once the production's gone, the violation's abated. 
Um, so we did what we can. We, we are kind of limited on what we can do in the planning division. Um, we don't have the ability to go out for all of these productions and make sure they leave at 10 or make sure they don't come before 7. Okay. Um, we, do, we do the best we can. All I can say is if I get a permit beforehand and I'm able to accurately process it, 99% of the time, everything runs smoothly. We don't, they'll, they'll tape it to the mailbox, they'll tape it to a driveway, or they'll do whatever they can to get that distributed. It has my number on it. Um, I deal with citizen complaints a lot, especially in the Piru area. I, I can't, the 50% the plus one, um, it, it's, it seems to, to work because we do get people getting close and communities will come together and they can shut down productions pretty easily. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it, it is difficult and our hands are a little bit tied just because we don't have physical people on site to make sure they're complying with everything their permit says to. Okay, so one more quick comment on that. So if there is a violation mm -hmm. and there is a party that is the most impacted by that, after a violation has been brought to your attention, wouldn't the county want to hear from the person that was, um, that the victim, Oh, per yes. se, call it that. Uh, and then what happened is the county said, okay, now you have to go out and get your signatures, and they still avoided the person that was the most impacted by their filming. Yeah, and that, that I, I, I and wish. And that's my, that's my yes, concern. Yes, yes, and, and, and I did speak with a couple individuals on that production yeah. um, personally, and, and I did speak with the production company, and we were going back and forth, and the production company was claiming that they distributed to 100%. Now, I, I understand it's, 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 it's back and forth. That, that's the, the problem I kind of run into is there's no way for me to physically, if they say they taped it to a mailbox or they taped it to a fence, there's no physical way for me to, to tell if they really did or not. Unless you just needed to know that you had received something from every single resident. Yeah. Is there any sort of, excuse me, is there any sort of bond that they uh, uh, have to submit along with the, uh, the application and fees no, uh, for damages or other incidents that might come from that? Or does that liability fall on the property owner? Falls on the property owner. Who allows it to happen? Yep. We used to have a requirement for insurance. Um, a couple years ago that went away. Um, we had discussions with county council. We realized it didn't really protect the county. Um, so homeowners, public works requires it for use for the public roadway, and private homeowners can require it. It's up to them. But yes, we do not require a bond or any type of insurance to issue these permits. Okay, thank you. There is any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Next is discussion, report by the planning director on board actions and other matters. Thank you, Chair Dukas, and thank you to Thomas. That was his first time down here. So he is one of those great um, behind-the-scenes workers in the planning department that issues 350 to 400 film permits a year without um, hardly a peep. You know, the film industry is always um, writing in saying what a good job he does, as is the film commission. So wanted to, to thank Thomas for, for being here and putting that together. And then also his manager is uh, Trisha Meyer. And so you probably recognize Trisha. She comes. Um, she, her current job is um, she manages all things condition compliance. So if you have a condition, and she's the, the person in charge of that every three-year cycle. And so she's got a, a couple of people that do that. She also does the manages the Mobile Home Rent Review Board, the Cultural Heritage Board. She does the websites, all the brochures, the hiring, and that is a, a, a long and lengthy process, I'm sure that she'll, she'll tell you. Um, all the census data, the data management. So she has a, a, a very big job. But I tell you all of this because um, she's now going to be moving over into Rosemary's job. So she is going to be the manager of our long-range planning um, section come January. Yeah. 
So you'll be seeing a lot more of her then because um, both the Planning Commission and the Board has given us about a five-year work program for our long-range planning. So we have lots of things that will be back here. Um, and the, the next big thing that we'll be back here f to talk to you about is the wildlife migration corridors after the Board is finished. Um, giving us some some direction on that and the last phase of the CIAP grant which will be the ESHA the environmentally sensitive habitat which will really be the the uh, controversial item that uh, that we'll be doing so Tricia will be managing those so I just wanted to while she was in the room um, let you know that she was going to be the new face of our long-range planning so um, while I'm always giving good news here, I also want to um, give some recognition to Anna here for providing us all with these beautiful yeah. books to keep us organized. So um, Anna does a great job in the planning department, and um, we had two people for a long time, and Denise has been retired and, and, and gone for a couple of months, and Anna is just doing a phenomenal job in keeping everything running seamlessly because I get emails from her at 6.30 in the morning, so I'm pretty sure she comes in early. Um, so, and this, let's, let's get on to the, the board action. So, a couple of things. I want to report to you actions that the board took. Um, so, on September 27th, they heard a map amendment revision. So map amendment revisions go directly to the board. So I'm not sure if you see things on the board's agenda and wondering why you didn't see it. Those go to the board. This was a, a particular homeowner out in Santa Rosa Valley that wanted to expand the building envelopes. And, uh, and so they got a, a, uh, a unanimous vote from the board on that. And then on October 4th, the board heard... Um, a project that uh, that your commission had voted on three to one and that was a hearing on an appeal of the Planning Commission's uh, approval of a new wireless facility at Rincon Point so you might recall that was a uh, palm tree um, and so the board um, three to one approved that and upheld the Planning Commission's decision and that has since been appealed to the Coastal Commission so It'll be a while before they get a, a final decision on that. Um, it's, uh, there's nothing on your calendar, so I sent a quick note up to staff saying, I know that there's things to be decided, so I'm wondering where things are, and so hopefully they're scurrying around up there, filling up your agenda, but I don't see um, anything on there after today, but I do have a couple of things um, on the board's agenda, so on November 1st, they'll be hearing a couple of things. Uh, they'll be hearing another map amendment actually to the same subdivision out in Santa Rosa Valley um, where uh, they're going to be talking about whether solar panels can be installed in a restricted area of that or not. And so they'll be hearing that on November 1st. They'll also be hearing an appeal of the Planning Commissioner's decisions on 728. It was a vote of 5-0, and this was a reactivation and the operation and maintenance of three currently idle oil and gas wells. And that is up on Koenigstein Road. So we'll be having another appeal on that. I want to say that we've tallied up the appeals maybe in the last few years, and we might be at 30. I mean, it's just a really unheard of number, most of them being on oil and gas. Um, and then so the uh, we talked a little bit today about sea level rise. And we have applied for um, a grant from the Coastal Commission, the California Coastal Commission, to begin addressing what, what any sort of policies or programs may look like, essentially, in a built-out community to see what that would mean as far as um, a sea level rise. And so they have generously offered us um, $225,000 to begin that work. And so we'll be going to the board because the board has to accept that program because there'll be a level of in-kind. Um, so nothing comes for free. So there's a, there's an in-kind that the board will have to offer up. And so they'll be um, researching and they'll be hearing that from us on um, November the 15th. And then on December the 6th, the board hears our um, LCA programs and they'll be hearing this as well on December 6th, which you heard today, the phase 2B of the LCPs. So this, um, your recommendation for approval will be going forward to them and this will leave us 
working on those issues that you were struggling with today, including the, the issue that uh, Chair Dukas brought up. So we'll be having a very clear um, decision on that or a direction on that when we go to the board. Um, and then I, I did mention a little bit earlier wildlife um, corridors and habitat connectivity. That's been a big issue that we've been trying to um, get staff retained in order to address that issue. And so we're going to go to the board on January the 10th to kind of seek some direction to give them some a series of options and, and kind of ask for their direction about how they want us to go forward writing those um, that ordinance language. And so we have a we have a full agenda. Let's see, the, the general plan update, I'd like to give you just a quick um, update on that. So the we have uh, completed the background report and it has gone through our technical advisory committee and so we've gotten all of their comments back. We're using a nice program called SharePoint where everybody works in the same document and so everybody's comments are included in the same document. Um, the vast majority of that report it was just recently sent off maybe last week back to our consultants so they can incorporate all the documents. So we have a, a really nice, robust, essentially existing setting. What does the county look like right now? So we have something to compare it to. So there's an awful lot of work that went into that document. And then on the other hand, we've been out in the community. We've had 12 workshops on, on what's called assets, issues, and opportunities, or essentially, you know, what do you like about your community, what don't you like, and what do you think that the county could do to, you know, to put those things in that, you're of, that is of concern to you? What can we do to study those items? So we went out uh, 12 workshops during the night, during the day, during the weekends. We went out to um, Lockwood Valley on a Saturday and spent the time out there. Um, we had 250 in-person participants come. We've had 130 online participants come, and essentially we had 2,400 comments. So we're wading through those comments and compiling them in some sort of a, an order. Did, um, did you get that? Did you get that guy from Santa Monica? I've got his name here. Yes. Did you? Okay. Yes, good. I did. And so, you know, they're busy, the staff is busy summarizing those reports right now. So we're putting together a very week-by-week uh, -week timeline. You know, this project is due to be completed in early 2020. So we'll be putting down a timeline so I can give you some dates of when you can expect that we'll be back with you for some decision points. Um, so that's what's going on there, I think. Uh, and uh, I think Thomas mentioned earlier that the Coastal Commission, you know, they meet all the way up and down the state every month. They're in a different location, so it's it's uh, very hard for us to get to them if our hearing is in Yukaipa. So we're very happy. We asked them earlier on when they updated the phase uh, 2A, which, you know, included parking and tree protection and filming and archaeology. We asked them if we could be put on calendar when they're in Ventura. So they are going to be in Ventura. They have their meetings at City Hall. Sometimes they've had them in this room as well. Um, it's going to be December 6th. So they'll be looking at our Phase 2A um, on December 6th and hopefully weighing in in our favor. That's all I have. Where so, Where is that going to be? City Hall. Okay. Oh, and Jeff has uh, Jeff has something as well. You know, just really quickly, it's been a while since we last met, and I wanted to let um, your commission know, you might remember the Epona Estates um, outdoor venue CUP that your commission denied unanimously. It went up to the board. It was a tie 2-2 vote, which means they didn't get their permit. They um, subsequently sued us, the county, in federal court, claiming that we violated their First Amendment rights yeah, because, right, um, because and it's a, it's a really novel legal theory um, because they host private weddings there uh, they we, we infringed on their First Amendment rights and um, our ordinance is, is gives too much discretion to our decision makers because people might hate weddings and we might discriminate against them so anyways we're vigorously um, opposing that lawsuit we're um, gonna file a motion to dismiss uh, which will be heard in early December so hopefully I'll have good news um, next time I see you so, uh, not our lupa. The, the our lupa also. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. I just okay. Kind of shorthanded it. Yeah. Okay. Hidden Valley. The it Hidden was uh, Valley right, near yeah. near Lakeshore Wood. Yeah. But weren't they still having events? They, they yeah they they keep having events yeah, yeah. Okay. Are there items by the planning commission that you want to have? Yes. So happy. 
very interesting how they uh, set it up where they have the, the vineyards are kind of separate from the, the estate area and they're 40 acres. Most of them, if they have 40 acres, then they can, um, they can actually have lodging as well as wine tasting at their vineyards. But it, it, was, it was very well thought out and I definitely um, recommend it if Ventura County moves in that direction. They also have a, a, um, a green belt uh, with mixed ag, so it was it was a, a good experience to see how they're managing that. Um, and so they would like to come have the uh, conference here in uh, 2018 in Ventura. So we will host that in 2018. We will all work together on that. <laughs> I was going to ask, did anybody go to the uh, the other um, marijuana seminar? Yes. Because I didn't attend. If anybody has a I, I did attend. I'd like to hear. Yeah. Go ahead and put your um, microphone on because we're still being filmed. That's true. Yes, I did have an opportunity to attend, and I still am finding it very interesting to learn about all of the collateral issues that um, come with the legalization of marijuana. And I think uh, Ventura County Behavioral Health did an outstanding job with their um, with, the, with the seminar that was put on the speakers that they brought on gave us perspectives from both sides um, and I found it to be very helpful the trailer uh, Kim uh, Chris is working on that obviously uh, at the direction of the board I assume that's still progressing this and we're still basically on hold uh, until after the elections before we put something forward to the board or to the commission to forward to the board? Is that kind of the timeline? Yeah, that's correct on recreational marijuana, on correct. medical marijuana. Do you know if that's been scheduled for a hearing, Jeff? I don't think it has. I don't think it has either. Yeah, that um, means my recollection, my con I think, of my comments were basically the mar medical marijuana has been on the books for 20 years. We basically ignored it. Uh, within within the county ordinances, if it's not mentioned, you can't you can't do it. And it seems to me, with the way everything is going, there ought to be something in place, regardless of what happens during the election, to deal with the issue of medical marijuana in the county. Either say it, it's not allowed, or or somehow you know create the the mechanism um, for it to exist. If it's, otherwise, we're going to have a mess with people starting to create uh, storefronts, if you will, right. to address the need. The, the board already has given the, the agency director, Chris Stevens, and he's been working on that for quite some time and has gone back to the board several times, so I'm not sure if Jeff has an update on that or not. Yeah, and at the beginning of, of the, the board's process, and it started, I think, in January or February of this year, the, the first action was a board to um, um, uh, expressly ban uh, cultivation and basically dispensaries and, and manufacture of marijuana products. So the status quo is that marijuana-related activities are, are not allowed in the county um, with the understanding that the county um, is working on regulations to um, at least potentially allow marijuana activities in some form. One of the things that um, caught my attention when you were speaking, Commissioner, was that uh, there are collateral issues and uh, the more that I look at what's actually before us on the ballot might undo the Compassionate Care Act unintentionally. So something beyond, beyond our purview, obviously. Kim, can I ask a question? Sure. Is there um, efforts that are taking place to help have cities and the county um, meet so that they're aligned on some of the issues? Yes, yes, that does occur at the city manager's meeting, right? And and um, I know our agency director, Chris Stevens, is also participating. I think that is the, the hope, right, that you would want to all get together and do the same things. I'm not sure the likelihood of that coming out, but that, you know, that is always the direction that, that we start out on, on issues that impact us all. Um, I also want to, to say, two things. I would be remiss if I didn't tell you about the um, short-term vacation rentals. So the board has also given um, the agency director, Chris Stevens, some uh, direction on that. And so that item will be back in front of the board on November the 15th. So the board will be 
you know, giving some, some guidance at that point probably to the planning department about what regulations, if any, we're going to add into our ordinances. Um, and then I wanted to, to clarify, I just looked up the Coastal Commission hearing, and they, they do meet over a multi-day period, and the agenda isn't out, so I'm not sure which day it is, but I did say December the 6th, I thought, I, that's what I heard Thomas say, but it's actually December the 7th through the 9th. So we usually wait until we, you know, until the agenda comes out, and then we see where, what day we, we end up landing on. Yeah, that's it. Is there anything further? Okay, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you.